This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to a stripey start to our sunset safari on a rather windy afternoon. It is a little bit breezy out here, but still a beautiful day as the clouds have separated from this morning and we've got a bit of sunshine. My name is Tristan on camera. I've got Craig and we are coming to you live from South Africa, which means that we would love to hear from all of you. Remember that you can get hold of us if you would like to ask any questions or have any comments or just want to, well, say hello. And you can do that on hashtag safari live on Twitter. Now, it is World Elephant Day today, so we shall be probably doing all things elephant related at this rate. We're going to try to see if we can find an elephant herd. I know Steve had some this morning that were moving in a sort of south westerly direction from central, so we're going to go check twin dams quickly, and then we'll come up the Mulwati and hope that they may be in there after the wind started. Often elephants do go into a drainage section, so we're going to go look for them. And we'll discuss all things elephant and then after all of that we'll probably try and do a loop around try and see if we can pick up those tundi and Tlalamba tracks as well as see where Tingana ended up. I have a sneaky suspicion that maybe just maybe Hosanna is on a kill somewhere and Tingana is using his nose to try and find it and who knows maybe we get all of them together which would be quite nice. So that's the plan for this afternoon but before we do any of that we stumbled upon a zebra that is well doing what we're doing and sitting in the shade and just enjoying the peace and quiet of this beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's just sitting there taking it very easy. Now it's not alone, there are some others that are around but they're a little bit further away and up the slope towards quarantine. This guy's just taking it very easy. A few stamps of the feet and flicks of the tail as flies land around the nether regions which is quite common for many of our antelopes. Unfortunately uh, flies can be a bit of a nuisance to these guys and so you'll often see their, their tails wagging like that and them stomping their feet particularly when they're just resting like this so this is the way that they do rest very common to find zebras sitting or standing should I say in shady sections in the afternoon just waiting for the heat of the day to pass a little bit before they then start to go and graze and start to try and find some food what you'll also find is that they've probably been drawn here because they want to go and drink either they have already drunk or they're going to go and drink at the pan in front of camp and so that's why they're just waiting for it to get a little bit cooler before they go out into the blazing sunshine and go and quench their thirst before heading up onto quarantine where it's going to be much safer and I would imagine that most of these zebras are well aware that lions are in the area. This morning when I was sitting in the tent on nest camp duty it was a cacophony of noise coming from the northern side of Wuyatela and well actually inside Biffle's Hook but there were a lot of lions calling this morning and from what I gather the Inkauma pride met up with the Avoca males and there was lions all over the place. Everybody apparently is accounted for and fine, but there was lots and lots of noise coming from the northern side. So let's see if maybe, just maybe, they come south. The wind is blowing from the southerly direction, which will drag those lions back in this direction. And so hopefully this evening they might make an appearance too. Now, talking about lions and talking about windy, I know Brent Leo Smith this morning had lions and wind, so let's see if he still has them. Here in the Maasai Mara, all we can see is a paw, while the sausage tree pride rests on a little rocky outcrop under some croton thickets. My name is Brent Leo Smith, and I have the migrating wildebeest Vim on camera, and lions that are very much asleep under bushes. There's been quite a lot of movement of wildebeest and whatnot past here today, but they haven't managed to get up off their lazy behinds. But we are hoping at some point that that mass of animals that was around them this morning does edge a little closer. Remember, this is 100% live and you can send through your questions using the hashtag Safari Live. For now, the lions are still snoozing. Just a paw visible. Very tired kitties, you can see. We're actually quite grateful. The wind has literally been howling the whole day. It has only recently stopped, uh, probably about 10 minutes ago, uh, that it's actually calmed down. I think the amount of, look at that. Jeez, I didn't even realize. That is a pile of dust. We're not gonna say that's quite gross. But the amount of dust that is in VM in my eyes at the moment, um, and Justice, who's our 
Mara Ranger, who's out with us, is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, yeah, we've changed color with the amount of dust that's blown over us over the day. But that's one of the things. If you want to get the good shots, you've got to play the patience game. I can just hear the faint no, no, no of a wildebeest somewhere behind us. I'm trying to see where they are. So there are a few zebra around the wildebeest, obviously behind us somewhere, but even there. Gnuing can't wake up the sausage tree pride just yet. And let's go to someone who could wake up the dead, James Hendry. Says he, says he could wake up the dead. I've seen people climb out of their graves and run away at the sound of Brentlio Smith on the march. Anyway, hello everybody, welcome to Sunday afternoon, Sunday safari here, sunset safari is what I meant at this part of Juma. We are trying to find Shidhulu, the four-year-old Duchess of the West, she is a leopardess who we saw here this morning. My name is James Hendry. There we go. And on camera today is David. Hello David. Hello, yeah, we are. We're doing our level best to see if we can find some sign of this leopard, but I've found no tracks as yet. It is a glorious afternoon, albeit a little blustery, but that is expected in August. Please do talk to us, of course, using the hashtag Safari Live or the chat stream on YouTube. Either will do. It would be lovely to hear from you. Good. On we go. My total species count for the afternoon so far in terms of animals is one fly, which I'm going to try and kill the next time it lands on my face. I think I missed it. Hasn't been entirely successful. No, I don't think we'll do a live action broadcast with that. Thank you, Emma. Now, of course, Shidulu's name is Termite Mound, and so we're looking on all the termite mounds because that apparently is where she likes to hang out. I haven't spent long enough with her to know whether or not that is true. But it also is quite blustery. Now, I know that Brent was talking about the wind in the Mara, and it really is amazing how much it does blow in the Mara. But this month, specifically here, it does blow quite a lot as well. Not quite as much as in the Mara, but what it means is that the tracks of animals, quite difficult to follow after a day of blowing, but I haven't found any of her tracks. Now what she did this morning was she came in from the west, down, and then she sort of cut down the north-south cut line that separates her territory from Tundi's. Tundi, of course, is our 12-year-old queen of Juma, lives to the eastern side of Juma. And she was quite purposefully marking, but then she also sort of settled in for a bit of scrub hair hunting. So I wasn't really sure whether she was hunting or marking, uh, which was her priority. Which means that when we left her at about Hopper State this morning, she could either have gone down to ground, or she could have carried on and walked quite a long way in her continued territorial patrol. So I'm really not sure at this stage what she did. Hopefully some tracks will let us know, or even better still, there will be the carcass of a recently killed and very unfortunate antelope hanging from a tree somewhere nearby. That would be good. David, just look on top of that termite mound if you wouldn't mind, the far one there. Let us have a look. I will train my binoculars on it. I'm pretty sure we spotted a bush. We have. It isn't even a bush, it's a grass tuft. Fantastic. It's always nice to spot a grass tuft on Sunday afternoons. Sunday grass tuft. You do get an impression of how dry it is getting. Oh, I see we're back on me. Thank you very much for that, David. I keep sitting on the radio. Sorry about that. Okay, let's keep going. Oh no, I don't think so, Jennifer. I think that the competition that we sort of insinuated as the, that exists between Tandi and Shidulu is not in fact 
real anymore. I think it was to start with, I think, but they've very nicely settled up their territories. They may come to blows if one of them tries to expand into the other's territory, but I don't see why they would do that. Shadulu has occupied a territory to the west of Tandis, the old territory of Shadow, and who was Tandi's sister, and of course Tandi has occupied her mother's territory, Karula's territory here in the central parts of Juma. And as long as they're doing their territorial patrols and marking along the way, there's no reason for them to try and expand into each other's territories and have some sort of physical confrontation. I suppose the only conditions under which that would happen would be a severe drought need to go on extraterritorial hunting forays. The size of a cat's territory is almost exclusively defined by the amount of prey in the area. So if you go to very dry areas like the Kalahari or even drier, you will find that the leopard territories are probably up to ten times the size of the territories here. And if you go down onto the Sand River, which is not too far from here of course, where the, the game is even denser than it is where we are now, you'll find that the territories are even smaller than they are here. I suppose it's not almost exclusive that it's prey density, but certainly prey density makes a huge difference in an area of homogeneous vegetation. Right, now I've got the following uh, instruction. We're going to go to Taylor, apparently, who has got something in the prey-in of the Kenyan. Now, I don't know what that means, the prey-in in the Kenyan. Perhaps it has something to do with Sunday. Well, we did. We've now switched it up because Archie, well, he wants to film everything this afternoon. We have a crocodile, but we'll show you some of the prey species in a little while. Hello, everybody. So I just wave awkwardly until my name strap comes up. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Archie. And here we have a safari vehicle trying to sneak past us. Welcome to the Mara River. <laughs> Bizarre. Anyways, there was plenty of space to go around us, but you know, perhaps they desperately wanted to be on Safari Live. Who could blame them? Anyways, there's the prey species that James was talking about. <laughs> there's the zebra on the other side of the river in the reserve, just um, grazing, I suppose, as zebra normally do throughout their day. Now, you can see, actually, the front of the herd is now going in the opposite direction. That's not good for us. That's not what we want. Turn around, zebra, and come back here. We've been sitting all day long. No, I lie. That's an absolute lie. We've not been sitting all day long at this crossing. We've been sitting here for about 20 minutes, and I'm growing impatient. I think you ought to come down to the river. It's so nice. It's cool. The water's really refreshing. You know, it's you could maybe dip your toes in the water, have a bit of a swim. I mean, it would be risky because there's crocodiles and things like that, which we've already shown you. Lots of crocodiles, but they're so full, don't worry. There was a crossing here yesterday. Perhaps they snatched one up. They're probably full. So we're not sure what's going to happen. We're kind of just going to wait and see. And there's so many crossing points along the Maya River. However, there are also many spots that we cannot get to. But main crossing is one of the popular spots. But whether they'll decide to, well, I suppose, take the plunge into the murderous Mara River, practice for TV, um, <laughs> I don't know. That is what we're going to wait to find out, hopefully, this afternoon. Remember, this is a live and interactive show. You're all being exceptionally quiet today. Hashtag Safari Live, please, with your questions, or you can also talk to us on the YouTube chat. That would be very nice. Thank you very much. <sighs> Cenac, I don't think that there's a particular amount of time that a crocodile will spend in the sun. I think I think it's suppose it's a day to day. However, I would say at least 40% of their day is spent out basking um, in the sun. But on those really cold, overcast days, you actually don't see many crocodiles at all. You don't. You prob they're probably just in the water because you don't see them out on the banks at all. Um, but there's this group over here. There's the two massive crocs that we're looking at. They're exceptionally big. You know, they're well over four meters in length. There's a couple a little bit further downstream too, which we can't see, which also maybe might even be a bit bigger than this. And um, so on a nice warm day like this, they'll recharge the batteries. It's perfect. They're in a good spot because if any zebra do come down on either side of them you know they it's quite easy for them to just zip in the water and then of course try and eat them but again like i said we yesterday we had a crossing here and like one crocodile dived into the water and tried to swim after the zebra but it really was a half-hearted attempt so they must just be full they don't have to eat very much we know that with crocodiles i mean they can go 
for many months and up to a year without even eating. But I don't think that they go that long. Sorry, I'm not I've trapped myself on the. Sorry, Archie, I'm not stuck like this. I can't be able to move. But um, there's some hippos. Yeah. So the so the crocs I don't think necessarily eat for you know don't go without food for for about a year. They eat catfish and things in between. And lots of catfish in here. Now this part of hippos we see almost every single day we come past here, and they only woke up from their slumber about 10 minutes ago. They were all out on the banks of the river. And now they've decided to, well, cool themselves off. And they like it over there near the rapids. And sometimes we see those hippos actually going towards the, the rapids. And I think it must be like a massage. All that fuss flowing water going over their backs. And here's another small group. Hippopotamuses. These are the Mara River dolphins, which Archie and I, I now call them. No one is allowed to cross the river here. This is a no crossing zone, so no cars will enter the river. Although I'm sure over the years someone's probably tried to do it. So there's designated points. So in order to cross the river to get into the Masai Mara, you have two options. You can either go all the way around outside of Olololo Gate and then get to Musiara Gate, which is in the Masai Mara National Reserve, or you can go all the way down to the south, to the border of Tanzania, where there's a bridge called the Purungat Bridge or the Mara Bridge, which is also known as, and you can cross down there and then go into the Masai Mara. So those are the ways that you can essentially cross the river, bridge down that side. Although I did hear little governors, I think they've got like a pontoon, don't they? Hey, Archie, they pull, do they pull vehicles across? Which is exciting, but I don't really know how that works, so I'm not going to try and dive into too much about that, because unfortunately I just, I, I just don't know. But um, it's not looking very promising for us just yet. I don't think these zebra are necessarily going to cross this afternoon. They could just hang around and maybe, you know, we'll meet them tomorrow morning at cul-de-sac crossing. And I've told you many times that it is my absolute favorite spot. And the reason why is because the water is quite deep and there's also about three and a half million crocodile there. No, not really three and a half million, but I feel like a bulk of crocodiles, and, and we don't often get to see so many in, uh, in a group together. So we'll keep that, well, we'll keep that at the back of our minds. That might be where this herd goes. But we'll probably move on from here. We'll probably go see if we can find some lions or something along those lines. Anyways, off you go, back to James, who is on a bit of a bumble. Yes, I'm on a bumble. I'm looking for leopards. That's what I do. There's a forktail drongo, David. Do you see it? It's that blackbird. It's flying away. Quickly. It's flying away. Hurry up. Ah, you got it. Well done. Forktailed drongo. One of two drongo species we get here. The other, the square-tailed drongo, which I've never seen here. But apparently it does occur. I'm not convinced myself. And it looks exactly like that one, except, David, it has a... A square what? Tail. Yes, a square tail. Well done. Absolute genius. And now em, Emma's just telling us that we are looking at a fork-tailed drongo, which is very exciting, and that we haven't seen a... Uh... You remember that thing you used to do when you clicked? You remember that, David? What are you supposed to do, everybody? When he brings the camera back towards me, is go... And then I'm not like this, looking at my monitor when you come back to me. And then I am... Um, see? Watch, watch. This is how it's supposed to look, everybody. Watch this. Okay, go, Dave. See, that's what it's supposed to look like. Unfortunately, he's neglected to click twice today. Sunday is no click day, apparently. Right, oh, this is very exciting. In the middle of the day, uh, Tristan has found uh, something that also lives in a matriarchal society, but isn't an elephant. Can you guess what it is? Yes, indeed, James. Very odd, actually, to find a hyena sitting in the middle of the day exactly where we are in the Mulwati. This is probably one of the first times I've actually found hyenas here when there's been no kill around. So I'm actually just scanning all the trees around me just in case 
There's a sneaky leopard carcass, well not a leopard carcass, but a carcass that maybe a leopard has caught and put in a tree that is around here somewhere. But you can see this hyena is looking rather dopey and happy with life, sleeping in the middle of the sand. And I suppose it's a great place to have a bit of a rest. Yes, I'm sorry, am I talking too loud? I'll keep it down, I do apologize. But it is a good place to rest because, well, the sand molds to their body. Also, it's got a nice little bank with some shade. That's going to be the perfect place just to rest for the day, stay nice and cool a little bit of a breeze that's funneling through the drainage line i suppose fairly quiet as well so it's a good place to be if you are an animal it's why we often find lion and leopard sleeping in the Mawati system during the course of the day and, and many animals actually will sleep on the sand you find even things like buffalo and ellies will often come and rest in these kind of areas now i'm keeping my voice down because this hyena gave me a glaring look when i was speaking too loud so now i feel bad and don't want to wake it up too much but did you see how it got comfortable and stuck its legs out the back so i love when hyenas lie like that they'll push their back legs way out and they almost lie flat like we would with their legs tucked under their chest just to have a little bit of a rest Alana, yes, it is very normal for hyenas to be on their own like this. There might be others tucked up in the bush somewhere close by, but it is very, very normal. Now, Aubrey is calling me on the radio. Let me just quickly get a hold of him. Go ahead, Aubrey. So, normally you'll find hyenas on their own like this when they're looking around for food. And... So, I'm just listening to Aubrey's update quickly. I'll get back into the hyenas now. So he's still talking. When it's a good update that we're getting. Okay, copy that. Orbs. I'll slowly make my way that side. So it's just an update on Tingana, which is always very nice. But talking about hyenas on their own. So what you'll find with hyenas is that, I mean, they do spend a lot of time by themselves. Particularly if it's males that are around, they'll kind of move off and do their thing, and they go looking for food. And then, because males don't spend much time at a den site, they'll wander around. And if they don't reconnect with some of the other members, then they just find a spot to rest during the course of the day. And you'll find them on their own like this. So it's nothing untoward to see a hyena on its own. Normally, you know, we obviously find them in groupings, and that's because when we do find them, a lot of the time, it's when there's some sort of kill around or some sort of um, ruckus that's taken place that's attracting more than one individual but it's very common to find one walking around by itself or lying down like this now i'm pretty sure this is one of the clan males difficult to see nicely I, it's obviously got its head tucked down and even the telltale ear, mar ear marks are not really easy to see particularly because the left ear is kind of folded away so in terms of iding this one will be quite tough i know that many of you are very good at iding our hyenas and often let us know exactly who they are so michael and chris rogue and all of you if you're watching crystal as well if you're watching then you can maybe let us know who exactly this is i am trying to learn them so michael has been very good at it and has sent me a few um, ID kits for the hyenas so I'm trying to get better at the Juma clan particularly because they've made a reappearance after a few months of really not much going on we kind of had um, no hyenas over the last few months and then all of a sudden we've just got this pushback and corky and pretty that have arrived back in this area and they've really started to kind of settle down and I know Steve had one of them was it this, I think it was this morning or maybe yesterday that looks like she's very full and lactating and I'm pretty sure it must be corky or pretty one of the two of them and so it'll be interesting to know where they're hanging around what's noticeable is that the Mulawati system seems to be the kind of core of where we're seeing them we're seeing them east and west of the system but a lot up and down and when you come in the mornings lots and lots of tracks for hyenas going all over the place and so I wonder if they're just trying to find a den I'm not sure if they've actually given birth I kind of doubt myself at the moment because we've checked all their regular spots we can't really pinpoint a den and given that we are doing a lot of drone work in the early mornings at the moment so we're often out every single morning flying the drone at night and we're not picking up anywhere where hyenas are settling every single morning so to me that indicates either they haven't had yet or two they've had it just off of our boundary and they're using this as an area to hunt and find food um, whereas and then go back to den off Juma or they're waiting to give birth and they're just still trying to find an appropriate den site but given how much they've been on Juma I'd be very very surprised because if their den was off of Juma you'd find that they would go south or west or east a little bit to go and forage for food as opposed to just coming all the time to the north or to wherever they you know to, to Juma itself so I have a funny feeling that they might be somewhere and just looking around for something 
So, John Michael, definitely a size of an ear is, is often indicative of how good their hearing is. You can imagine when you've got a tiny, tiny small ear, the amount of sound waves that can go in there is probably far reduced um, relative to the, the size of the eardrum. And to give you an idea of how much it, it can affect your hearing, when you're sitting at home now, John Michael, take your hand and make it into a sort of C shape. So almost do it like this. So just make that kind of shape with your hand. I'm gonna do it on my left ear because I've got an earpiece in my right ear, so it doesn't really work. And then you just cup it around your ear like this and just have a listen as to how much better you actually hear. So anything where you've got a little bit bigger that can trap more sound and funnel it into the eardrum will help you to hear things a little bit better. So it's often why people do this when they're trying to listen to something and trying to hear something. So it's, it's, it does help them and you'll find a lot of the nocturnal creatures tend to have quite big ears in relation to the size of their heads. Um, so things like hyenas, um, you'll find lion and leopards, their ears are quite big. Um, even, you know, there's all kinds of nocturnal animals like genets, civets. Um, civets not so much, funnily enough, but genets definitely, their ears are quite big and, and perky. Um, you'll find things like the nocturnal mice, gerbils, their ears in relation to the size of their body are all quite large and are able to kind of pick up a lot of sound. I'm sorry, are we keeping you awake? Nope, just really get, getting comfortable. Now it's getting into that perfect hyena pose where legs are stretched in all directions while its head goes down. Right, well, our hyena is still very much sleepy. We're going to head off now and try and see if we can go catch up with Tingana. While we do that, let's send you back across to Brent Leo Smith, who's up in the mar. I wonder if he's got his goggles on as he gazes upon the lions that are still dozing off ever so soundly. Been absolutely zero updates from the sausage tree pride. They are still lying in the exact same position as they were earlier, and I don't foresee them doing too much just yet. It's still quite warm, and the smorgasbord of prey that was around them this morning is a little bit far off. Uh, we've got some zebras, some topi, some gazelles, the odd gnu in the distance. I'm just trying to see, you know, it's, I think it's a bit too far for you to hear, but right in the distance you can hear the wildebeest gnooing, gnooing. And yeah, you can see some wildebeest in the distance there. Hello, Scott. Scott is wondering, do lions kill leopards if they get the opportunity yes they will all apex predators given the opportunity will try remove another predator from the ecosystem leopards will often kill little lion cubs if they get the chance so will hyenas and vice versa now of course lions are much much bigger than a leopard a very big male leopard will weigh around 90 kilograms so 200 or so pounds where there is a very small male lion will weigh 180, 190 kilograms, almost double the weight. And a lioness, 120, 130 kilograms for a big one, 115 to 120. They are a lot bigger and a lot stronger than a leopard. And leopards obviously have a little bit faster turn of speed for escape, but also they can climb trees. Although if they get caught out here or far away from a tree, it might not be too good to be a leopard being chased by lions. I have heard of leopards even going down warthog holes to try escape lions in this part of the world. So the instinct to survive is quite strong. So we'll see what happens. Well, you know, uh, Colleen is wondering, do lions eat waterback? Colleen, yes, indeed they do. It is a complete old wives tale that they don't eat waterback because they don't like the taste. Um, of waterbuck because of the gland on the base of the neck that secretes that oily substance. If a lion is hungry, it will eat waterbuck. The fact that it will not, or the, the, the story that it won't eat waterbuck is a complete and utter twaddle. What you got through the gap in the trees there, Vim, we've got some more zebras, I think. Now, we're looking all the way down to Tanzania in the distance. Here we go. So that actual, let me see, just my finger in here. Where is it? Uh, no, I'm not going to get my finger in there. Sorry, Vim, just go back there. So that far ridge over there, 
that is very much Tanzania, even the foreground. But you can see there's a little valley in there, and that's the Mara River where it flows into Tanzania. And you see there's still some fire fires burning on the southeastern side of the Mara River inside the Serengeti National Park. And you can see we are sitting uh, on the big burn that happened in the Mara Triangle a few weeks ago. And that lush green grass is what's bringing all the wildebeest, zebra, topi, tommies here. And that's what's bringing the lions as well. Now that little Inselperg there is right on the border. And uh, favorite hangout of the border boys, two male cheetah. They are quite often seen in that area. Hi, Willow. Willow says, we haven't seen the Thompson's gazelle in a while. Are they at the back of the migration? Yes, the, the migrating Tommies, that is. But we do have quite a large uh, resident. Oh, there's a dust devil. Uh, resident population of Tommies that actually never leave the Mara. And there are quite a few, but they are very far off, I'm afraid, dotted amongst the wildebeest and zebra. I can see some Tommies. I think we're going to struggle there. And see those are the closest there BM. so if we go out to that lone tall balanite that's got all the vultures in it that one there yes and we go off to the left slightly along the ground somewhere there we go is that an impala what does an impala no we keep going left from the impala and there was a little herd of tommies there somewhere oh what well, i think it might be behind the bush for them Oh dear, sorry Vim, the Tommies are behind the bush. Maybe we can find a Tommy that's not. And you can see the wind has started gusting again here in the Mara. So let's send you back to James with a birdie. Cut line. He's north of the boundary, but they say he's like five meters off the road. Well, he went further north and he's now coming. Now, unfortunately, we had no comms there at all, so we are live now. We're just ch chatting to Craig exactly where Tingana is and where we're going to go. He's north of a boundary at the moment, but we'll try and see if we can pick him up and see if we can get a view of him. But it's been a I'm just sorry, I was just heard about a herd of elephants too. Where is that? No, on Biffle's hook. Not going to help us at all for World Elephant Day. So we're going to try and see if we can get head off towards Tingana. I'm going to go up on Vulture's Nest just to check if there's any sign for Tandi, Kalamba or Hosanna in the meantime. I'm pretty sure Hosanna's on a kill somewhere. If he hasn't shown up at any of the water points, and we've checked pretty much all of them, then he's either on a kill or he's crossed out of our area for the first time in a long time. But given that we haven't seen any tracks, I highly doubt that that is the case. So I think he might be still lurking about somewhere around these areas. So it'll be worth just keeping an eye out for him. But this is a very breezy afternoon. We checked around that hyena as well. No sign of any tracks for a leopard. No leopard kills in any of the trees. There's just the tracks for the hyena coming down the road and then down the drainage line and lying down there. So it's so obviously just having a little sleep and taking it very easy. It was very relaxed when we drove past. It just sat there looking at us as we went past and then decided to have um, a little bit of a a rest and sleep once we left so still there and if we don't have luck with Tingana we can always go back now I'm going to carry on northwards towards Gauri cut line while I do that send you back across to James Henry who I believe is well looking at something that Tingana might want to eat You'd be very lucky to catch one of these things. It's a very large waterbuck bull. Now Brent, of course, was talking about the fact that it is an old person's tale that waterbuck are not eaten by lions. That is, of course, true, what Brent says, not what the old people say. Now, that's very unusual for that to be the case. Anyway, the other thing that is, I think, 
something of a misconception regarding water buck is that they always run into water and when I was reading up on them the other day and none of these textbooks are infallible of course it said nothing about that but it did say that they are very water dependent and that's why you'll find them in the vicinity of water more often than not and they have quite an interesting territorial setup because of it obviously there's a finite amount of water and so what you'll find is that waterbuck bulls will set up territories close to water big fellas like this but they will tolerate youngsters within their territories and subordinate bulls within their territories if they don't cause trouble and interestingly also oh apparently we're going to discuss this later let's go across to Tristan who's got a world something of the day on the move the rest of the herd is crossed already Well, our Ellie search has been rewarded, basically. So we found one little young bull, Ellie, that is by itself, that is walking around. And so happy, well, elephant day to everybody. Hopefully it will be a sign of many Ellie's this afternoon. And it's such an important thing that we have these kind of days. And I have shared a few pictures on my own social media. And it, I have kind of two feelings about these days that we have. One is that it is very important that we raise awareness and that there are days dedicated to such iconic species like the elephant and two days ago was also lions and that we have these because it raises awareness and tries to get more and more people to know what is going on. But a very large part of me gets very sad that we do have days like this one because the reason we have these days is because these animals are being persecuted at a rate of knots and we have really got a lot of issues sur surrounding not only you know elephants and lions but many of the iconic African animals and it really is sad to think that many of these populations have been absolutely decimated by the hands of humans and the greed that we show sometimes when it comes to these animals now he's just wandering off I'm not going to follow him through here and I'll tell you why one is that it is incredibly windy and this animal already reared its ears and was looking a little kind of stressed about us being here and when it's windy often Ellie's will be a little bit funny two is where it's walking now is that is so thick in there that all I'm going to do is hit trees and spook this elephant even more what I did notice is there is tracks for the rest of the herd going in and I'm pretty sure they're heading up towards the dam so they're gonna to go towards where the dam cam is I think that's the route that they're heading into the Mawati and then hopefully northwards so I'm gonna go round and then hopefully catch them towards the dam a little bit later this afternoon that's the plan at least but I was saying that it's important that we kind of talk about Ellie's and we or and any of the iconic animals and try and raise more awareness and try and get as many people to understand how dire a lot of the situations are when it comes to these animals you know we kind of often see things and even us as people who work with in these areas and see animals on a day-to-day -day basis we go, become a little complacent in that you know we see them in populations of elephants here where we are healthy and not being persecuted nearly as much as maybe populations elsewhere in, in the world and it's it's an important reminder that you know we need to be more focused and more kind of aware of what's going on and try and sort these things out because if we don't it's not going to be a very long period and there will be nothing left for anybody to view and can you imagine what a sad day it would be to drive around a place like this and see absolutely no elephants no lions no anything it would really be a very 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 depressing thing to do so I'm hoping that in life we'll come up with a plan and people will forget about how greedy they are and start to actually focus on looking after animals and coexisting and hopefully then we'll be able to start seeing these guys thrive once again it's pretty dire when you think that both elephant and lions have been reduced to pretty much about 20 percent of their original range Sinak, it depends on what reserve you're in but here in the Sabi sands um, the Ellie's are protected mostly by very 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 efficient anti-poaching units so the guys that are trying to stop Rhino poaching are the same ones that are protecting these areas from elephant poachers and making sure that they're not getting into the reserves and actually trying to, to hunt these elephants. It's, it's not an easy job and we do lose elephants and the Kruger went through a very good period where we had 
almost zero elephant poaching and it's just starting to increase again right on the fringes of the South African border with Zimbabwe and Mozambique um, and so we're gonna have to be a bit careful we're gonna have to just keep an eye out and try and concentrate a little harder and trying to keep people out the problem with a lot of the elephant poaching that's happening at the moment is because ivory is not consumed by people it is you know it's used for decorative purposes and those kind of things it doesn't need to be consumed so they how they kill them is often by poison at the moment and what they do is they go to a water hole and they'll poison a water hole and the yellies then drink from it and as well as many other animals so lions and vultures and antelopes they usually use a, a substance called temink which is very very bad it's a pesticide basically and kills everything um, and that's how they get these ellies and then they just can kind of get them there are obviously times when they do get speared and shot and all kinds of other things in other parts of Africa but in Kruger mostly what they've been seeing is it's either a rifle or a poisoning that happens now Aubrey's calling me again go ahead Orbs Gauri Katla and Central Junction. Copy that, thanks Orbs, I'll be there in two minutes. So Aubrey's just checking where I am because he wants to leave Tingana, but he doesn't want to leave before we get there in case we drive past him, which is very, very nice of Aubrey. But so our ranges, our anti-poaching units here are vitally important. They really do a lot to try and kind of protect our Ailey's as much as possible now i'm sorry em i hardly heard you all i heard was mara so i think i'm going to be sending you off to the mara the wind is really playing havoc with being able to hear anything this afternoon but hopefully it is the mara and hopefully it is to something exciting well the lions have not moved a muscle and uh, there has been one change we have spotted a Thompson's gazelle much closer. You see him there. There's a couple wandering around just over there. Here they are. For those who are wanting to see Tommies who've missed them. Now, let's hope she. It is a female there and she moves out. I find Tommies absolutely fascinating. They are an antelope species where the females are in the process of evolving to not have any horns. So impala, um, female kudu, female bushbuck, female nyala have already gone through this process. And you often find really bitty, scrappy bits of horn on female Thompson's gazelles. The males still have really prominent, very visible horns, but the females often bent, skew, all sorts of funny shapes and angles on them because the evolution process is still taking place. Now, other than that, we had, did have a little, it looked like a black fly catcher that popped in to visit, but it's disappeared. It's flitting around in this little croton thicket around here. There we go, I can't see it at the moment. Uh, Monique is wondering what is the difference between a Thompson's gazelle and a springbuck? Well, firstly, one that lives in the arid desert areas of southern Africa, uh, by over probably 2,000 kilometers, or a little bit less than that, but over 2,000 kilometers away from uh, the closest Thompson's gazelle, which are endemic to East Africa. There we go, there are the Tommies there. And, uh, they're probably the closest relative to a gazelle in southern Africa is a springbok and you can see they have very similar colorations and whatnot. Tommies are quite a bit taller. Their horns are quite a lot more prominent as well. And uh, if a springbok had to live in an area as wet as the Mara, what's that snorting going on down there? Oh no, it's just some, you see the zebras having a roll in the dust there, yeah? Now, if a springbok had to live in an area as wet as the Mara, they would actually get foot rot. People have tried to move springbok into wetter areas in southern Africa. It would be nice to have a springbok on my farm type thing. 
and they have died out quite quickly due to foot rot. So they are desert adapted creatures. They are not going to like the the wet of the Mara, firstly, and you probably find that the uh, Thompson's gazelles wouldn't like the dry of uh, the Kalahari. Now Grant's gazelles a little bit more adaptable. They 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 do occur into much drier areas in the Maasai Steppe, which is that way. So beyond here towards Ambassadia and stuff, you go down and it gets drier and drier as you get towards the coastal plain. Uh, you get Bisa Oryx there, um, Golden Wolf. Who knew there were two species of wolf in Africa? So up until very recently, the, the Golden Jackal, uh, which is now in an Asiatic species only, was considered to live in the more drier areas along the east eastern dryland, Savo, down into the Maasai Steppe, into into, in, into Tanzania and Serengeti, just on the edge. But now with genetics and stuff, it's turned out that they are not. They're actually a, a relict population of grey wolf that have... What have you spotted, VM? Ah, a topi. That have uh, been isolated in Africa. They're much, much smaller. I will see if I can actually find you a picture of them. So I've been keeping a careful lookout on all the black-backed jackal in the Mara because you never know uh, there could be a, a small population of African golden wolves it's amazing how much stuff you can actually see from up here KV is wondering what is the advantage of, of female antelope having form, horns it would be for defense of predators. And when you're as small as a Thompson's gazelle, they, there's pretty much nothing you can do. Now, with the males, obviously, they have the horns for sexual competition, for fighting over mating rights, where those, the females have slowly, not well, slowly progressed and evolved not to have uh, the, 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 those prominent horns anymore. If you think about there's actually very few female species of antelope that have horns. The most notable one that we actually see, and I, did I see some a little bit earlier in the distance? Um, that we see in the Mara is Eland. And this is probably one of the first days where I haven't been able to see Eland in this area. They might have gone for a drink. I'm checking around that little water hole there. Nada. No ways. There must be an Eland, and I'm just being blind. No, nope, I cannot see a single eland amongst everything else. Ah, well, I'm going to keep looking for a picture of that African golden wolf for you. In the meantime, let's send you across to Tristan, who's got a lovely Sunday afternoon surprise. We do indeed. We've got a rather sleepy duke that has decided to take a nap right next to the side of the main road. So he's having a really good kind of serious sleep. And I can't blame him. He walked quite far this morning from where Steve found him to where he is now. He's a good, good distance. And you can see he's got quite a full belly. So I'm not surprised that the duke has passed out and decided this is where he is going to nap and where he's going to take it very easy. He's just on the northern side of, of our boundary, on Vilfelzook's side, but close enough that we can get a perfect view of him should he even wake up. He's, I think, going to nap, though, pretty successfully, much like our hyena was for the majority of this afternoon. Wait for that sun to get down a little bit, and then it'll be interesting to see which way he goes because he's kind of been pushing into Buffalo's hook a lot more of late, been a lot of vocalizing, and then he heads quite far north. The guys were telling me the other day that he went at least a kilometre north in Buffalo's Hook, which is a long, long way. It's much further than he's been in a long time. So I wonder if there's maybe not a female that's in estrus up here or something that's going on, or he's just stamping his his mark because he's tired of having all these other young males roaming around in all these sections and kind of pushing into his area. Given that he is the dominant individual, you would expect him to 
come back after being a bit sick and to really try and stamp his authority and he's been successful in putting Hukumuri further west and keeping him at, at bay for now and so now he's got to deal with the likes of Umfukazi, Kwatile, um, not Kwatile female that we know but Kwatile the male that came out of that Steve once saw I think it was Steve that Steve saw down near Trias Dam so that random young male that hunted a warthog I don't know if any of you remember that but Kwatile who's been seen a lot actually around the gates and has been seen on the Simbambili side at One-Eyed Pan so I'm pretty sure he's been on to Juma quite frequently we just have missed him probably because we actually haven't been spending a lot of time in the northwest of the property so he's been around and then there's also a couple of other random males and so I'm pretty sure Tingana is kind of going up and just trying to really sort things out and just make sure that everybody understands that he's back and is really the ruler of this area now it's been amazing to watch his resurgence from this sort of meek figure that looked down and out and looked downtrodden to this you know supremely confident male once again who's vocalizing and scent marking and looking bulky and good again it's been actually wonderful to watch and just goes to show you how resilient these big cats can be you know if you had kind of given or well, said this is what would have unfolded many people would have said it was not going to happen so sorry um, if you can just repeat that again for me Jess, I mean, it's difficult to say. Uh, you know, they're both cats that kind of don't have a lot of endurance when it comes to running for long periods of time. So, you know, leopards and lions are actually pretty similar in a lot of respects. They're both built very similar, uh, powerful, big cats that are not designed to run marathons. I'd probably say in terms of endurance to run for a longer period at top speed, I would say lions. Um, given that lions hunt in a certain way they like to kind of go and hunt in more open sections and we see it in the Mara that they probably end up chasing for a lot further than a leopard does a leopard is an ambush predator and, and in these kind of areas will generally only use a short burst of speed and then stop so I would imagine lions have a higher endurance in terms of top end speed and running for longer um, in terms of walking and just going around all day long difficult to say both of them are pretty good at doing it we see you know male lions and male leopards covering huge distances in some areas um, so in terms of walking they're probably very very similar in fact I don't think there'd be too much difference between them but top end speed and, and running I would imagine that lions do run for longer stints when they have that top end speed than what leopards do leopards tend to be much shorter distance animals and so because of the way that they hunt it's a very different way of hunting compared to what lions do they aren't going to be using these long-winded chases through open grassland to bring down their prey so a little bit shorter running times although in saying that i once had the most epic hunt from mvula at chitwa at the airstrip so just next to the airstrip there's that big open clearing and I watched Mvula run like a cheetah across there and kill a impala. It was pretty impressive stuff. He must have run easily over I would say probably about 200 meters actually and the impalas for some reason just bombshelled in all directions and one ran straight at him and he was able to just kind of slam it to the ground. So they do have these kind of things where they are able to run after impalas and those and, and, and sometimes make a hunt like that but very seldom and so their endurance at top speed is quite slow well quite short should I say now indeed it was an epic sighting and Vula was, it was an amazing thing to watch I was quite surprised by it all actually it was complete pandemonium and you'll see you we just saw you know we had a flat tire and then this Mvula as we got the flat tire we were out to try and change it because Mvula was walking and hunting and then we were kind of changing it and we just saw him start to go and jump back in the car with the flat tire left the spare tire lying on the ground drove on the flat tire to try keep up with him and then saw him take it down it was just absolute pandemonium and chaos chaos so you know it was a quite an epic sighting but it was one that didn't last very long after that because unfortunately hyenas arrived and stole the kill from Mvula but amazing to watch now David you think the rainy season is going to bring Hukumuri back Possibly. It depends. It depends on what goes on. Hukumuri is going very, very, very far west at the moment. He's been seen going into Ottawa, which is the western side of Elephant Plains, so towards Singita, which is a long way, I can tell you that, from where we are. And so it's very possible that Hukumuri, unless he 
finds a female in heat. So Tundi could be the kind of key to all of this. If unless Tundi drags him back here, I don't know if we're going to see too much of him. He's now mating with the likes of Tiani and Shadulu. And if he has cubs that side, I wouldn't be surprised if he spends more time there trying to protect those cubs and trying to protect that area because he's been mating than it is to come all the way east like this. So maybe the rainy season does bring um, him back into this area. I think it's, there's a lot of variables that might are at play. It's, it's not only... The rainy season but it's Tingana's health and fitness over the next few months and yes rainy season will be much harder on Tingana it's going to be much harder to hunt um, you know it's the cats the big cats really struggle a little bit in the rainy season compared to the winter the winter makes it much easier for them their coats blend in better as well as you know animals being distributed in areas where they can regularly find them in summer everybody's spread out and it becomes a little harder for these guys to find food regularly so that's that's two factors the third is what happens with Hosanna? What does Hosanna end up doing? And whether Hosanna challenges Tingana or challenges Hukumuri in some way at some point, because he will at some point. Once he starts getting to this time next year, Hosanna is going to be pushing to start having a territory. You know, by then he's three years old, and that's when you often see males starting to move and become nomadic. And by four, they're starting to really challenge. So Hosanna is going to be an interesting part of this whole component. And what other leopards arrive in the meantime? I mean, if we think back a year ago, there was no such thing as Hukumuri for us a year ago, and, and nor was there Mfukazi well Mfukazi would just started to arrive Quatila male was we didn't know about him we didn't know about a lot of these males that have been seen on Buffles Hook there's another unknown male that keeps being seen as well around the northern part of Buffles Hook so you know there's a lot of variables at play and, and those will all depict what happens it also depends on what happens with Anderson what happens on the western side of Hukumuri does a male leopard come in there and chase him back east or does he find more females to the west and, does, and become more dominant westwards it's it's an interesting thing in the last few years what we've seen is most of the males disperse eastwards as they get older so if you look at Mofufanyan he was dominant around the central parts of Arethusa um, and then he started to slowly push more and more east until eventually he was seen a lot around Chitwa. Then you had Mvula, who was mostly in the east. Tingana was the same. He came from Elephant Plains, Simambili area, pushed his way west, now dominant on this eastern side. Um, and so we'll see what happens. You know, the, Before those, though, there was a lineage with Tyson um, and that lot that all went southwest. And so I wonder if Hukumuri is going to be one of those that pushes to the southwest rather than back this way who knows it's going to be interesting but it'll definitely the rain season will shake things up again it's a whole different set of problems that these animals will face and 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 you know if Tingana can't find food regularly then who knows his condition could plummet again quite quickly and and you'll find that he you know could then be ousted Laura Shungile's disappearance and we've discussed this many many times and uh, there's no real new update on it unfortunately it's it's one of those things that happens um, young leopards do disappear from time to time it's not ideal but it does happen um, Shungile I mean she she was only a year old really or just over a year old when she met Tandi which is makes life very difficult for her she's you know was never going to be physically matched to Tandi Tandi was bigger stronger wiser um, and had a lot more to to more of a point to prove than what Shungile did so you know she was always going to struggle whether or not that meant that she got fatally injured that day we don't know um, we have absolutely zero idea what happened after the Tundi fight which was on the 16th of August if I'm not mistaken so four days from now a year ago is when that all happened and where she ended up what actually happened we have really no idea the next morning Taylor went there she saw a lot of tracks going in a lot of different directions um, so whether you know right there I think we would have found a carcass at that actual kill site or some sort of evidence that she had died there um, I if she did die from that in interaction it was because she probably got ba very badly injured and wandered off and eventually then died somewhere else or she she pushed into another area and unfortunately ran into some other leopards or lions or something that uh, that maybe killed her or she's or she's still alive and she's walking around in some random block in the middle of Kruger that no one sees her and no one even knows where she is it, it happens I mean we know that um, Shivambalana, Mishu and Duna um, even Sakani, who's really done very well. So for those of you who don't know who any of those leopards are, a lot of those were Karula's off other offspring that were boys that went into Kruger. And we get very rare updates on them. In fact, sometimes it goes months before we see any sighting of them. And Sakani was a female that came from Quatile, which 
is a similar line to to Karula. So Karula's mother was Safari. Safari had in Tima, and Tima was also um, was the mother of Kotile. So it's a it's the same kind of lineage, roughly, and but not this exact same mother. And she ended up going all the way down into the Kruger Park area. And she's now dominant south of Skakuza, a long, long, long way away from where we are. She's had her first litter of cubs, which is very exciting. And they are being seen quite a bit. And, you know, you would never have thought, well, I never would have thought. And in all my experience, I've never seen a female travel that far. And so it's you cannot rule out the possibility that Shungile has ended up going deep into the Kruger somewhere, into an area where no cars are going, and we just don't have updates on her. It's, it's very possible. Just remember that some blocks inside Kruger are three times the size without a road. There's not one single road going through them, are three times the size of the entire Sabi Sands. So when you think about that, think about how many leopards are dominant in the Sabi Sands, female-wise, I'm pretty sure it's close to about 50. And then you think of an area three times the size of that, and that's where she could have gone into. So it could be in an area where there's 150 or 100 different leopards that are dominant in that section and she could just be right in the middle of all of that so it's possible that she's still alive possible that she's just hiding out in one of those blocks um the, the only thing for me is that to get to that point i would have thought somebody would have seen her she was a relaxed leopard she was a leopard that was easily visible she didn't wasn't shy from vehicles and i would have thought we would have got one kind of update somewhere of her getting out of this section heading into the kruger but we didn't and, and you know it's possible she did so I don't know. I mean, I for me, I strongly believe that she, unfortunately, something happened to her. I, I don't think we would have seen her just vacate here and not come back once more. I mean, we've seen with Hosanna how he's stuck around, even though he's interacted with many different leopards. Sure, he hasn't had the same violent interaction, but he was there that day. He was part of that whole process, and it didn't phase him in the least. He was still around. So I wonder if something else didn't happen to her, and she just tried to move off and bumped into something else, or... You never know. I mean, there could have been all kinds of things that could have played out that day. Many other leopards were around. Um, and she managed to charm Mvula the, ti the times that she bumped into him, but it could have been very different if she had bumped into another male leopard that was in Buffel's Hook or something like that. So it's, it's a sad thing to think about. She really was an unbelievable leopard, and by far the most relaxed leopard that I think I've ever seen on foot. I've never seen a leopard behave like she did on foot. It was really quite phenomenal to watch her and watch some of the interactions that James and Brent and Jamie and pretty much everybody had with her in you know in the beginning of last year. It was just an incredible, incredible scenes watching her go about her business and see how she ended up doing things. So it is a big loss and hopefully one day she'll make an appearance somewhere. That would be quite nice. Good. Well, while we sit with Tingana, who's belly up and sleeping away the day, let's send you back all the way across to Brentlio Smith, who I think is probably in a similar boat to us and is watching his lion sleep. And I wonder what he thinks about Shongile's disappearance. Well, our constant companion for the day, the bustly Masai Mara wind is back. Of course, as soon as we try to frame up on the bedraggled croton bush, it's get stopped a little bit, but um, I'm going to have to go take a photograph of a golden jackal at some point because, oh, a golden wolf, sorry, golden jackal are in Asia. So that is the African golden wolf. Now, of all the canid species that are alive today, the large canid species, I wonder if you can tell me, I'm going to give you a list of a couple and you've got to tell me which is the most ancient. Okay. Which of these is the most ancient? The dog. The European grey wolf or American grey wolf, they're the same. The Himalayan grey wolf, which is the Asiatic uh, wolf version of the wolf. Um, what other one can we throw in there? African wild dog, coyote, or side striped jackal. Can I think of any more I can throw in there? Oh, black back jackal, just for fun. Or Asiatic golden jackal. Which of those is the most ancient? It means it's been split from the main line it's got the most ancient genetic line so hashtag safari live if you think you know the answer and no cheating with google
someone will be watching. Not me, of course, because I'm watching a bush, but under the bush is a lion that has not moved in how many hours, Vim? <laughs> since, <laughs> since about 11 this morning. <laughs> oh, a good few hours. So what's that? I don't even know what the time is now. Oh, seven hours or so that uh, since that, that that those lions have moved. They walked quite a long distance after feasting on a few wildebeest this morning, but they didn't finish those wildebeest. So we're hoping they're still hungry, and uh, we're hoping that some idiotic canoe is going to come stumbling into them or zebra. and listen to the wind there for a bit. And remember this is live, we can't force these animals to get up and on the move on their schedule. So we will be waiting for the lions on the lions schedule. That's what doing live wildlife's all about. Let's go see how my good friend James Henry is doing. Well, we found something that's standing up at least. It's not a cat, it's not what we were looking for, but there we have some kudu. K U D U, kudu. Female kudus. F M F E M A L E, kudus. I'm not sure where that came from. I'm sorry for that, everybody. I was obviously uh, taken by the spirit of some long dead thespian. There we have a female kudu. And she's got three friends, four friends. Uh, that is not unusual, not because kudus are necessarily more friendly than anyone else, but because they choose to live in small groups, which helps them to see predators that might want to eat them. And in this particular area, I think they're pretty safe. I've seen very few kudus being eaten. I know the Ninkapuma pride did kill a male, two male kudus, I think, recently. But the females tend to be able to stay away from them for some reason. They're a great meal for a lion. They're not exactly bristling with weaponry to fend off lion attack. They are fast. They can kick and they can jump. And I suspect maybe lions just think that there are easier things to get at. But I would have thought they're quite easy to kill because if they live in thick bush normally, to find them in the open like this is quite unusual. So who knows, maybe they don't taste so good. Omkar, the fastest, fastest herbivore that we have is Steve Falconbridge. He is a herbivore. Uh, he's the only herbivore we have that runs, so he is the fastest that we have. Um, I am, of course, being facetious. He's not faster than a Thompson's gazelle. The fastest antelope in the world, contrary to what we told you for months last year, is not the topi. It is the Thompson's gazelle. The Thompson's gazelle is almost as fast as a cheetah, but not quite. It can run at about 90 kilometers per hour, they think. It's very difficult to measure, of course, because if you ask a Thompson's gazelle to run in a straight line, they normally stare at you as though you've stepped out of a piece of cheese. It's not surprising, their English and Swahili is not quite what it should be. So it's very difficult to work out exactly how fast they are. They can work it out with cheetah, because cheetah have been domesticated in some places, and there's that amazing film of them shooting a cheetah at full stretch. Basically they make it run like they make greyhounds run, they put a, uh, a rabbit on a winch. And not a real rabbit everybody, it's a f fake bunny on a winch and the cheetah chases it in a straight line so they can measure exactly how fast it's going. And they shoot it with a very specialized camera uh, that shoots at over a thousand frames per second. You don't really need to know what that means, but it's just super slow-mo, and it is astounding to watch the cheetah move at that speed. Anyway, uh, that's not got a huge amount of relevance to what you're looking at there, other than to say, on car, we do know that the Thompson's gazelle is extremely fast, much faster than the kudu, but the kudu holds another Olympic record, and that is for high jump. They are able to jump very high. I think that would be the fastest herbivore in the world. 
They're very gorgeous. And then there's one actually chewing its cud, lying down there. You see that, David? Underneath the dead tree that we've used on Bushwalk 587 times. There it is. Chewing her cud. Yes, it is a lovely Sunday view. A lot of you saying you're enjoying the Sunday view. I like to walk normally on Sunday afternoons. I find that the most appropriate thing to do. Unfortunately, the bushwalk camera is, uh, well, shall we say, in a state of disrepair at the moment. And so to walk is not possible. So I've had to bring the car out on Sunday afternoon. But that's okay, we're having a peaceful kudu sighting. It is, of course, World Elephant Day, which I must mention, even though I can't find any elephants just yet. I will keep trying to find some elephants. Is there a World Kudu Day? There probably isn't. Sorry, chaps. <laughs> no World Kudu Day. You just make every day you will see. World Kudu Day. I guarantee you if there was a World Kudu Day, we wouldn't find one on this property. <laughs> so one, two, three, four. I think there are actually six of them. Six kudus. The one on the left is being particularly uninspirational, I feel, at this stage. It's not really doing a great deal. It's not dancing, it's not jumping, it's not running. Le Khumu Kudus Ko Horns, uh, in this particular case, their total growth length will be naught centimeters, because, of course, they're all females. But Le Khumu, uh, the males, have horns. You know what, I actually don't know what the longest would be. I'm going to guess probably about, I reckon about four feet, you know. I reckon the longest horns would be around about four feet long, which is 13 meters. No, that's wrong. It's the other way around, isn't it? It's just over a meter. It's about one and a half meters tall. So it's quite a lot. Doesn't sound right, does it? One and a half meters? No, 1.3 meters or so. Um, <laughs> 13 meters is definitely wrong. A 13 meter kudu horn would be something to see. I suspect the kudu wouldn't be able to lift its head. Ah, well, we've now got a whole research team going in the final control. Apparently six feet, the longest kudu horn ever, is re, um, ever recorded. That's about 1.78 meters, so that's huge. That's actually massive. That's taller than me, David. I know that's difficult to believe. It's in fact your height. You are six feet, are you not? Yes, you are. I am not. I am three foot four. Right, I believe that the great Quizmaster is back in action. It's quite nice to have the great Quizmaster back in action. Let's go back across to him, find out what you've won with all of your answers to his great quiz. Three, two, one. Well, since the lines are near invisible, the quiz game will continue. Now, I asked you which was the most ancient, of course, uh, when I mean they diverged from the same line. Uh, so we'll see who got it right, who got it wrong, and he was completely on the wrong side of the world. Uh, so far we are not having luck with any idiotic wildly beasts blundering in as they do do from time to time. Vim and I were just chatting and, and working out how long we've been with these lions today, and uh, we found them just before, probably about quarter to six this morning. So, in a little while, we would have been with them for 12 hours consecutively. Well, back to the quiz. Jared's buddy uh, said the American grey wolf. Bap, not correct. Elise said the golden, Asiatic golden jackal also not correct. So I'll give you a little bit of time, see if anyone else has got any answers. Uh, I'm sure someone must get it right. Croft, sorry, I'm battling to hear names in this wind, which is now back in full force. Uh, Krofefe said African wild dog. No. 
but I think our Owen Davies was correct and and that was it is indeed the side striped and black backed jackal that separated from from the main Canada line so dog is the most recent but there we go side striped and black backed jackal 2.6 million years ago and uh, African wild dog around 1.9 million years ago the golden Asiatic gold jackal between 1.9 and 1.6 million years uh, or oh, actually 1.6 million years Ethiopian wolf 1.3 million years and uh, what have we got coyote Himalayan wolf um, 800,000 1.1 million 800,000 years and the dog and the American or whole Arctic which is the correct term gray wolf which occurs into Europe Russia uh, North America is actually relatively recent within the last 500,000 years so there we go a little bit of Canada Canada love I had Canid history there we go it took it a while to get out and uh, it's definitely taking the sausages a while to get out of their lovely little spot this evening so I'm hoping that this strong wind it does lead to good hunting weather let's hope hopefully they didn't eat too much earlier today and uh, they're not going to want to leave the seclusion one of the reasons they moved into this area where we were, where we are now we were over there in the distance we can see those there we go we were a little bit to the right of them those trees in the distance were somewhere over there now the amount of dust that's coming off uh, the, the ground and the short grass and the burnt areas and dust devils and from the burn was causing a lot of discomfort not only for our eyes but also for the lion's eyes that's why I think they moved on to this little isolated pocket here that didn't get burnt it was quite green when the fire came through and also has these little croton bushes for shade also just to get away from that incessant wind and sand now someone who's not dealing with incessant wind and sand is Tingana who's just having a lazy Sunday afternoon Indeed, Tingana is having a very lazy Sunday afternoon, which is fine. That's okay. He needs to save up all his strength so that he can keep roaming around and keeping, one, Hosanna around, and two, allowing Tlalamba to grow up nice and strong. So I'm quite happy with him to be around and to be sleeping so he conserves his energy for his nocturnal sort of jaunts that he does. And... You can see he's kind of flattened himself out a little bit. When we last saw him, he was on his back a bit, so his paws up. But he's now flattened himself out, and his belly is moving quite briskly. And a lot of people often see cats and see them breathing like this and think that there's a problem. Um, but no, that's not how uh, anything to worry about. That's pretty normal for cats, particularly ones with full bellies. They do breathe quite rapidly, and that's just part of their controlling body temperature as well as the the fullness of their belly pushing up on their lungs decreasing their capacity to take in huge amounts of oxygen so slightly quicker breath when they have eaten a lot i i wonder from like i was saying earlier i wonder from here where he's going to go I, it's one of two directions the thing is with the wind is that it's pushing a little bit from the north so i would imagine he's going to walk into the wind um, I don't think that we would see him walking southwards um, with the wind at his back. I'm pretty sure he's going to push further north, deep into Puffles Hook. Interestingly enough, while I've been sitting here, one of the guys told me that the Inkahuma Pride eventually this morning went into the north and managed to kill a buffalo. And they apparently are in this, right on the Manuleti boundary with Puffles Hook on the Manuleti side. But they are sharing the car, well, they're around the carcass with the Talamati Pride. So no wonder there was so much noise emanating from the north this morning. It's because those two prides are very close together and apparently the Voca boys are somewhere in the mix there too. So it's all chaos up that size. Um, and I wonder if we're going to see any fallout from that and whether or not they'll share it amicably or if they're going to move. Interestingly enough, I was talking to Rex about the Nkuma Pride and I know we're looking at Tingana and we're straying off on a major tangent at the moment. But I was talking to Rex and he was telling me that the Talamati's Torturids and Inkahumas originally all stem from the same pride. Now I'm not sure if that's 100% right, maybe somebody will be able to tell me this, but he's 
of the belief that they do and that's why that they've seen many sightings of Inkuhumas, Talamatis, Inkuhumas, Torchwoods actually sharing kills before because way back when apparently they all split off from a, a same pride which is very interesting to me it's it's quite amazing to think that that could be three different prides given how successful all three of them are at the current point in time so I wonder how long that's going to last for them to be tolerant of one another I think as the prides get bigger you might see that they're a little bit more kind of aggressive towards each other and pushing each other out and away now you will see also that it is a very windy day you can see the grass is rustling all over the place and so it's making it very difficult to actually hear anything or pick up anything that's around us so it sounds eerily quiet other than the rustle of the wind normally when we sit out here you hear birds chirping and you'll hear the odd kind of sound of an animal but this afternoon it's a very eerie kind of feeling because it's just dead silence other than the rustling grass there's no birds chirping it sounds very very odd and i wonder if that's going to make it better for the predators this evening as opposed to you know if there was no wind i'm sure it would do i mean if they walk with the wind it's definitely going to make life a lot easier for them right now before we see a feathered friend fly off from james let's send you across to him now we've got a very interesting bird here everybody have a look i'm going to be quiz master the apprentice today oh Oh, you see, that's the problem with being a quiz master apprentice. You get things wrong. You don't give sufficient time. You got him still. Yeah. David, the deity who created that bird himself would be unable to identify it from that picture. What I think we had there is a booted eagle. Can you see there, David? Yes. There is the booted eagle. You could see that he had a brown head, definitely. He had a pale front, not quite as pale as this, but they do come in different color morphs. That's the pale morph. And then he had dark wings. I say he, it could easily have been Mrs. Booted Eagly. And if you look at that one, we much more closely aligned to one of those two, so possibly an immature Let's see what other pictures we can get. No, I didn't see any of that or that. Uh, that's a picture of South Africa. Um, <laughs> there we go. Yes, I think that's what it is. Now, Brent Leo Smith found this booted eagle, probably the same one, actually, last year. So let's ask him about that while we discover where it's gone. Oh, look at that. We heard a very distinct... <whistles> oh, they might just hear it over the wind calling. So we just moved the vehicle a little bit and we've discovered a BSK. A black-shouldered kite who looks to be in the process of nest building. There we go. You can hear that... <whistles> My black-shouldered kite impressions are absolutely horrible. Now, quite a wonderful little raptor that we see quite a lot of in the Mara. Uh, they're often seen hovering around looking for small rodents and insects. They are extremely beautiful. Now we've also tried to check on where the rest of the pride are, but we also spotted another wonderful bird. Oh, off he goes. He's going. Oh, they just see how they just glide in the wind. Lovely camera work for him. Aha, I think we found where the nest is now. Unfortunately, oh, we are quite far from a road, so the chances of us ever coming back to this exact spot to try and check on the nest. Yeah, there we go. It's taken off. And it's I think it might even go back to that diospirus to break off. There we go. It's the pair of them getting ready to have a few more. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, we'll keep an eye on them while we're here. But I want to show you if we can, or first we want to see if we can find another member of the sausages. 
but we spotted another bird as well and it looked to be a female northern white bellied bustard as they call them in, oh there she is in Kenya but we call them Korans in southern Africa right ahead her head's just popping off that bush a little bit to the right there she is hello Gil Oh, no, well, no, actually, I think it's a, it is, it's a female black-bellied bustard. I couldn't see her clearly now that she's stepped out. I can see her nice and clearly. Uh, when I just saw her head, I thought it might be a northern white-bellied female, but it's not. It's a northern black-bellied bustard, or a black-bellied bustard female, not a northern. So she's also been hiding up amongst these rocks on the hills. And you can see that wind has started up again. Now, just below that nest of the black-shouldered kite, or the BSK, and you can see it's really rocky here, so you got to be quite careful. Um, yes, there's another semi-invisible lion. And we can actually... Ah, hang on, Vim. Hold on, we gotta get over this one. Oh, we're so close. Let me just. There we go. Oh, that was a big rock. And there is another <laughs> lazing line there. Not offering much better, little, uh, much better vis visuals than the last. but directly below where the black-shouldered kites are building a nest. Okay. Lovely views down the valley towards Tanzania. Now, of course, it is a wonderful day today it is world elephant day and they are one of my favorite creatures who i've been lucky enough to spend hours upon hours on foot with so let's go see some with madam mccurdy look at how cool this is and of course i made a mission out to the marsh especially for world elephant day how could we not and this is actually really, really pretty. And the reason why we parked the way we did is I actually wanted to show you some of the luggers. Look at this. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what a lugger is, it's basically a natural drainage system that fills up with water. So maybe at some point it was part of an old river course, but it has since changed quite a bit. And of course, the elephants love to live around here as well as the buffalo. Lots of water for them to drink, especially while it's so hot at the moment i'll probably have quite a bit to drink and then the, well, the buffalo like to wallow around in the mud and the elephants like to cover themselves in the too. it's very windy as i'm sure you can hear very very windy it seems like it's also windy in south africa good kite flying weather pity we've got no kites though archie have you ever flown a kite when he was a little archie flew a kite did you make your own kite he made it himself look at that what an entrepreneur <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, it's sad to think that in the 20th century there were between 3 and 5 million elephants roaming around. However, now in Africa, well, there's only about just over 400,000 African elephants yet. So between the two species, between, well, the subspecies, between the savanna elephant, which we're looking at, and then, of course, the forest elephant, which there are much fewer uh, than, than the savannah elephant but it is really nice to see them in such large numbers and you're almost guaranteed elephant sightings in these wetland these marshy areas otherwise it can be quite tough and they're good spots especially now that it's dry Archie and I were just saying that we think that uh, you know July is supposed to be the driest month but August this year is definitely the driest month Patricia, it's actually the other way around when it comes to mating. Um, elephant bulls come into a state called must 
So essentially, they are over, there's an overstimulation of testosterone. They get very excited, and they are constantly on the go searching for females and estrus. However, the, the elephant cows also sing a, well, I don't know if it's a beautiful song, they sing the estrus song, which of course will attract the males, and everywhere they've defecated and urinated, the males will be able to pick up on their scent and sort of follow them. But they don't necessarily sort of actively seek out a, a, a male, like for instance a leopard would, like, a, like you just said, like a leopard would do. A female leopards are particularly frisky. Elephant cows, not so much. Most of the time they end up running away from the males and uh, just every, you know, oh, there's a couple of people on safari too. I've only ever seen elephants mating once. I'd love to see it again. It was a spectacular scene too. It's, um, it's quite an overwhelming experience. The herd tends to get obviously, uh, well, I don't know if it's quite, if they're excited, but they trumpet a lot and they're all around. You know, it's obviously quite exciting for them as well. But very, very nice to see. But we will have to move on um, as we are searching for lions today. That's the most important thing we need to find. And uh, yeah, so last question, Byron. Um, elephant herds can get to fairly large sizes. Uh, you know, they're not necessarily all one family group. So I've seen a couple of hundred elephants together. And if they're all walking in the same direction and on the go, you know, you might find that you get lucky and see a thousand elephants together. But typically I'd say the average size group is anywhere between about 20 and 50 individuals. And then, like I said here, there's a couple of different herds that are all together. But we're going to move on now. Uh, like I said, we've got some priorities that we need to do. We need to try and find some lions along the river to hunt some animals. Off you go to Tristan back in South Africa who already has his cat. We do indeed. Tingana is still a very sleepy, very sedate kitty at this stage. There is some impalas way, way, way off in the distance behind us that we can't see at the moment. I just saw them briefly earlier that are slowly but surely going to come this way. They look like they're walking this way. The problem is they're on the southern side of him, so the wind will carry his scent straight towards him, so they'll see him. But maybe that will trigger him to start waking up and maybe doing something. I have a funny feeling, though, when he does wake up, he's just going to go straight north from here, and we're not going to see too much of him. I doubt he's going to come south. You never know, though. It could possibly happen. So for now, we're just babysitting a sleepy kitty and hoping that he does wake up and does decide to move along the boundary with us and maybe even go down towards the dam. But if he doesn't wake up and there's other vehicles that do want to come here, which it sounds like there are quite a few, then we might move off and try and go see if we can catch up with those Ellie's again. But Ellie's in this kind of weather are going to be a very difficult sighting because of the wind howling like this. Elephants are often a lot more on edge and they don't really like to be too close to cars and things like that when it's windy like this. They prefer to be in the thickets and have a bit of space. And so I'm not too convinced that we'd actually get a decent sighting out of them. Well, hello, Tinga. Are you going to wake up for us, boy? And come on. Uh, no. It was close, though. I thought we might even just get a little head raise out of him. But alas, he has decided it is not that time of the day just yet. To be honest, I'm actually not even sure where the nearest water is either inside Buffalo's Hook. I, I think there is a pan straight north of us. I've seen a few lapwings flying around, so it's not often an indication, especially the blacksmith lapwing, that there is water that's not too far. I think there is a pan just north of us, or north east, sorry, west of us at the moment that he might head to. Otherwise, I suppose the dam at the nest cam area would be the other closest water point now talking about the nest cam it sounds like steve is getting involved again with some high action of the feathered type <clears throat> good afternoon ladies and gentlemen indeed there is some high action at a new installation on the nest cam developments and we have got a number of bird species down here two gray go away birds on the left of the screen they've come down for a bit of a daily drink now being seed eaters uh, they need to drink from time to time to quench that never-ending thirst oh did you see the nice takeoff as they ran jumped into the wind and off they went the wind coming just from the bottom left of the screen that was marvellous. We had a blacksmith lapwing that disappeared momentarily off towards the right. Nice windy afternoon. We are watching deliberately to see if any animals will come down and drink. But when it is windy like this, most animals do shy away from watching holes. 
as it is a little bit too jumpy and the wind is quite scary for them because predators often lie up and wait and as we've seen before Hosanna really enjoys this watching hole where he is today we don't know here comes another go away bird for a quick little drink another one it's possibly even the same two guys hard to say but let's see if they use the same strategy of the wind to uh, take off after they leave we don't often see birds coming down on their own there we go look at that you don't often have birds coming down on their own because they are under a bit of threat uh, all sorts of small raptor species are looking for birds to come down on their own and yes folks this is a wonderful view conrad has been very busy reinstalling new different nest camps so we can get a good full aspect ratio of the small watering hole there we go this is the inlet side of the watering hole where water is actually actively pumped to provide water for the thirsty animals and as you can see the thirsty birds let's see how he does his takeoff Hello, the Lorax. You want to know when we'll start seeing chameleons? Well, they're around, um, but generally they start sort of re-emerging as we get the... There we go. Look at him. Off he goes. As we get the foliage back on the leaves and the insect blooms. So they are around. We're just not finding them very well. So they are definitely around, but they, they tend to move into the trees and a little bit more visible in the afternoons as... Um, well, not in the afternoons, but in the evenings when you use the spotlight, but uh, they are around at the moment few eggs in the ground i'm sure somewhere but we will definitely keep our eyes open for you for these very camouflaged chameleons okay so we're going to be going over to james henry who has found a very small and cute carnivore Yes, we have, everybody. They're called chocolate blobs. They're not really. They're called dwarf mongoose. And they are not going to be enjoying this wind very much, I must just say to you, because it's blowing onto the northwestern side of their termite mound, which is not where they want it to blow. This is the time of the day, especially on Sunday afternoon, when they like to sit on the top of their mound and have a little restful contemplation of the week to come and the week that was. And now they're being buffeted by a very strong nor'wester. You can see that they've lived there for some time, and you can see that from the droppings that there are on the, well, basically on the bottom of the mound. Yes, you can just sort of see them there. There seem to be quite a few inside. And I always draw comfort from these chaps because they have such civilized hours. And they always, at this time of the day, look exactly like I or look to be doing exactly what I would like to be doing, which is sitting, contemplating the day. With some tea and scones, perhaps or an orange cake. I've never seen them having orange cake though. All the mad activity of the day seems to have calmed down slightly for them. Because they are very active when they're foraging. But I like this little rest time that they have. It's most appropriate. We have found no further tracks of Shidulu, the female leopard, I'm afraid, but we are trying. Rosalind, um, poof, how fast is a dwarf mongoose? Do you mean in terms of miles per hour or kilometers per hour? I don't really know. Um, let's think of a human being. The fastest human being can run at an average of about 36 kilometers per hour. That's if you can run the 100 meters in 10 seconds. So not many of us that can run at 36 kilometers per hour over a sustained period. Uh, and I'm wondering if a dwarf mongoose is faster than a human being. 
I think probably, let's say roughly the same speed as a human being. So let's put them at roughly 36 kilometers per hour, a fast human being that is. Uh, most of us don't uh, make it more than 30, I don't think. I think the fastest speed a human being's ever hit is about 42 kilometers per hour, but that's obviously just for a few meters. All right, the Mingusta have uh, disappeared inside, possibly because Shudulu the leopard is about to appear. I don't think that's the case either, so let's continue. It certainly would be lovely, Emma. It would be lovely if Shudulu the leopard disappeared. I haven't found any of her tracks, so I'm relatively convinced she's still in the block where we left her this morning and that she may well have killed something. She was hunting. We might be very lucky to see her coming out as the sun begins to set. You may have noticed I've put on my jacket. Um, I put on my jacket on account of the fact that it's got a little bit chilly. The wind is a, not a bite to it, but certainly a, um, a chillsome edge to it. Yeah, I put on my jacket and David's put on his waistcoat, haven't you David? Yes, looks very smart on his waistcoat. Now I'm sure that you are utterly fascinated by my discussion on bush fashion. But I think we should go back to the Marsimara now. I'm not sure which Marsimara fashionista we're going to, but I'm sure they'll look wonderful. Well, James is a fascinating creature, albeit a slightly strange one. Now, we've managed to see another one of the sausage lionesses, well, the best view we've had all day since they arrived in this thicket. Look at the flies on her whiskers. Wouldn't that drive you absolutely batty? And in her mouth. Urgh! And on her schnoz. Now, of course, the flies here aren't nearly as bad as what the big cats face in southern Africa. There's a lot more for them to hang about on, like wildebeest and zebra and but they still do manage to get to the big cats. Now, as I say, we've shown you three out of the five sausages so far. Now, if we come into the shadow here, okay, so I'm going to go into the shadow in there, and a little bit to the right, a little bit down. There we go. That's a lion. Behind, uh, there's a patch of grass with a bit of green. If we go a little bit lower of him, a little bit lower. There, that, that white patch in the bottom right hand. There we go, Vim. That, that is a lion. So there are another two sausages underneath that croton bush. Now you, you've got to really work to see her through there. And we got some beautiful, oh, look at that. All the vultures waking up. Normally, oh, probably three species in there, possibly only two, but there's definitely, oh, what's that? Hello. Looks like a leopard face disappearing behind us, unfortunately. And then there was some rupels and white backs. Uh, Monique, no, lions do not stash their kills. They'll eat as much as they can. They might lie next to their kill. They might move it into the shade uh, to keep it away from vultures and, and hyenas. So, so they suppose they do stash their kills, but they're not like leopards um, who will put a kill up, leave it, go have a drink, come back. And at this time of the year, they actually just leave half a carcass lying around just because there's so much food about. Probably hear the wind picking up again. Oh, Patty, I'm gonna have to double check this, but Patty's asking, uh, do dogs and humans both first occur in Africa? Humans almost certainly, or hominins, which are the pre preluders to humans, 
um, hominins were definitely in Africa and, and the, therefore the first, first human beings. The first dogs, however, I cannot be 100% sure. I would think so. I might be wrong. I'm going to have to do some research on that, Patty. Sorry. Uh, but uh, the first domesticated cat, not the first cat, is from Africa. And uh, that was uh, the African wildcat was the first domesticated cat and was domesticated by the ancient Egyptians. But uh, as far as I know, I'm not 100% sure. As I said, I'm going to have to do some research for you about the first, um, the origin of uh, dogs. And uh, I suppose it, it depends what you define as dogs. Um, or modern dogs or whatnot, um, or ancient dogs, so jackals or whatnot. I'm, I, I actually don't know. I'm going to have to find out for you. Since the jackals sort of diverged and the African wild dog diverged the earliest, it would sort of make sense that it's probable that dogs evolved in Africa as well. Okay, while we sit here with these lazy lines and I have to go do some homework, uh, let's send you back to Tristan. Well, good luck with your homework, Brent, and good timing because Tingana just popped up his head. And the reason he's popped up his head is because he's slowly being surrounded by various different antelopes. We had some kudu that walked past earlier. They've disappeared to the north. And then there's some impalas that are slowly but surely creeping up on the southern side. Now, has he spotted the kudu? There's a kudu actually on the road now. So there's a kudu that's sitting on the road or coming across the road. And he might have just seen those. Now, if there's any baby kudu, Tingana used to be very good at hunting baby kudus. We often used to see him stalking them. So he was just kind of looking in that direction. There's a young male kudu trotting over the road. Now, Tingana doesn't seem too impressed by this. He's just flopped back down. But that's probably not what he's actually looking for. More than likely, He's looking for Hosanna and then he is looking for an antelope because, well, it's much easier to steal from Hosanna than it is anything else. But he's got some impalas around, some kudu around. There's a lot of things happening and you might find he'll lie like this flat because the wind is blowing in the wrong direction. As soon as they go past him and push north of him, then you might see him wake up and start trying to stalk and trying to come round. Um, and so... I'll just have to wait and see how this plays out. I haven't seen where the Impalas last went there. Last time I saw them, they were straight behind my car, behind a little thicket. And I can hear Oxpec is calling, so I would imagine that they're not too far away. Now there's a, a vehicle that's joining us now and is around, so I'm pretty sure they're going to come in and join us. And I wonder if that will prompt him just to pop his head up and see what's going on. So let's have a look. No, so far he's still sleeping tired boy this afternoon is Tingana he's decided he doesn't really want to wake up too much for us at all there's lots of things that could stimulate him to wake up so we'll just have to try and wait and see if we can get this right and hopefully he will but in the meantime James is well with the animal of the day and I wonder what they're up to They are drinking the animal of the day. Happy World Elephant Day, everybody. I'm very pleased to have some elephants on World Elephant Day. And a very happy World Elephant Day to you lot, having your drink over there. I hope that you know it's your day. Not sure that your day has been any different from any other day, of course. But, um, well, this is your day. Special day. Well done. Very necessary to have these days, of course, because awareness is massively important for conservation and elephants have received well slightly less publicity since the scourge of rhino poaching has dominated conservation headlines probably for the last decade or so but elephants also under huge pressure from poachers from the inevitable encroachment of human beings into wild places All right, now, I mean, you can't believe this, but the nest cam is having an exceptional afternoon today.
Right, the Nest Cam is rebooting itself, so apparently it's not going to show you some zebras. We're going to continue looking at our elephants. I thought they might come past here. That's very exciting. Let's hope they come past rather than through us. I think we'll just stay here if it's all the same to you, Emma. We have elephants approaching us. is wonderful. Hello my dear. How are you? Now she's quite easily recognizable from her broken right tusk. It's not broken, it's just short actually. Might be broken and then sharpened. Oh sweet. Isn't that lovely? Don't you get a feeling of peace as they wander past? just gave us a little smell, opened her ears very slightly and moved on with the rest of the herd. And then another big cow bringing up the rear. Just looking at David, saying what a fine looking fellow that is. Peanuts, uh, Lindsay, peanuts are an elephant's favourite snack. Absolutely love them and oranges, peanuts and oranges. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's true. I think their favorite snack is marula fruit, Lindsay. They are extremely enthusiastic about marula fruits during marula season, which will be probably January and February next year. They definitely go wild for marulas. Other than that, well, you know, they eat so much. They've got such a, what we call Catholic diet. You know, there's so many plants and things that they will eat that I'm not sure it's possible to say that they have a favorite. It depends on the area, I guess, but marulas they all love. They will raid citrus farms as well if given half the chance. Not these ones, there aren't many citrus farms in the Kruger National Park, but certainly in parts of Zimbabwe and Botswana they will raid citrus farms where they are not kept in or fenced into wild reserves switch off here, a little quiet drift down towards them. There they are. Excuse me. I want to give them a fright. Sorry David, I know that we keep drifting forward. Couldn't get the car in gear. Wonderful elephant bottom sighting we're having. There we are, it's not an elephant bottom, it's an elephant's head. Just so quiet. And they must eat and eat and eat at this time of the year. It's not easy. Now in the drought year, the drought of two years ago, I definitely noticed that the elephants lost condition. No question. And this year I have not noticed the same thing. I think they're doing pretty well. They seem to be finding quite a lot. And I think as far as dry seasons go, this one so far has been pretty manageable. Of course, we're only getting to the harsh end of the dry season now. And so September and October and November to a certain extent will be quite telling. Not sure when we're going to get our first proper rains. I just want to quickly show you something else here. It's not got to do with elephants. It's a tamburti tree over here, David. And in it there are some grey go-away birds. Now these grey go-away birds are going wild at the moment for the buds, I think, on the tamburti tree. And I actually need to go and pick some so that I can see exactly what they're going for. But every tamburti tree that's in this budding stage, you will find grey or go away birds in eating off the buds. And I'm sure I've seen it before, but I can't remember mentioning it before. So it really depends on the year as to how long the wet season lasts. Sometimes it's about half an hour, and other times, in a good rain year, Jill, it'll rain from sort of November, maybe early November, sometimes late October, and go all the way through to sort of March. 
and then it'll tail off again. That'll be the sort of rainy season. And in this part of the world, we could expect to have about 600 millimeters of rain, between 500 and 600 millimeters of rain. <laughs> He's a niche fellow. And 600 mils of rain is about five inches. Is it? No, it's not. It's absolute rubbish. Let me just do that again for you. 600 mils of rain is two feet of rain. Two feet of rain. Aidan, did you say, do elephants ever get stuck lying down because they're fat? Was that your question? Age seven. <laughs> no, they don't in this area. But they do, they do struggle, Aidan, to lie down and they struggle to get up. And I know they look like they're fat, but they're not actually fat. That's just how they're built. But that's a good question. You know, Aiden, you'll find that animals that live in nature very seldom get fat because, well, they don't eat what they're not supposed to eat. You see, we human beings eat what we're not supposed to eat, and so we get a bit fat from time to time. And if you put animals in captivity, often they do get fat. But not these ones. This elephant's got a very itchy bottom. He's also quite curious about us. Oh, you big strong fellow. Look at this. Always a young bull who decides that he's going to uh, give us a little show of dominance. That's so special. Lindsay, I can't remember, you know, I, when I get questions like this, I start to feel quite anxious because I can't remember a particular incident. I've had so many lovely elephant incidents and encounters, some of them on foot where the elephants have been quite far away, many of them in vehicles, most of them in vehicles. But anything when the elephant will come around and spend time around the car without actually interacting with the car. So when they'll come and walk past and just feed around there, maybe just give you the odd smell or that sort of thing. Those are the best kind of elephant interactions, I think. We'll just pop up the hill here and see if we can't have one more elephant day view. Jared, yes, it is possible, but it's very uncommon. Elephants do give birth to twins from time to time, but it's not common at all. It's very unusual. Probably, I would suspect, even more unusual than it is with human beings. So there are definite, definitely records of elephants giving birth to twins in the wild, but really very uncommon indeed. little one obviously not a twin unless it's twin with a meta sticky end but of course in this area young calves have a pretty good chance of making it to adulthood not like the predators of course who have a dreadfully tough time getting to adulthood and they're going to disappear into this little river system in front of us and we're going to continue I have kind of given up on Shidulu we might pop out to where she was as the sun goes down, see if she comes out onto the road. But otherwise we'll look around for what else we can find. Okay, let's move on. David, that was a much better click, I feel. Yeah, timing was, timing was good there. Well done. <laughs> All right, I believe that Tristan is still with the laziest cat in all of the Sabi Sant. Well, he is probably one of the laziest in there. He does pick up his head to just show James that he's not the laziest ever, but he is still a bit lazy at the moment, and I suppose, why not? He does a lot of work during the night and roams big distances and soars, and he's got a lot of pilfering to do, and so he might as well rest before that all takes place. So it's still very, very sleepy. The, the Impalas did cross the road probably about two, three minutes ago, and they were heading in little thickets kind of around the back of him. So just kind of keeping an eye out in case they make an appearance. He wasn't too interested in the kudu. They passed by unscathed, luckily for them. There wasn't any young ones 
big adult male, so probably a bit large to bring down, even though he's capable of that size, down an animal of that size, he doesn't really do it because it's just pretty pointless in that he can't hoist it, and so that means that he's going to lose it to hyenas. But Tingane, in his youth, used to be very good at actually bringing down large animals. He's brought down probably some of the biggest kills that I've seen from leopards in his time, so he's brought down a giraffe, which was pretty insane. In fact, two different giraffe kills that he made. The one was a very big giraffe, and in fact, he was dwarfed by the size of it. It wasn't an adult, but it was still a big individual. He's brought down two year old wildebeest and we've seen our herd of wildebeest that roam around quarantine you look at those ones that are not even a year yet and they are big animals so he brought two of those down in the same day and he's taken a few aardvarks which are big animals and, and a lot of kudus and nyala as well so he used to be hunter of big big things and i suppose as he's gotten older you know it becomes a little slower a little more difficult to wrestle with those and also experience has taught him that while hunting those things is pretty cool and it's and it's amazing to go after those it's not ideal from a point of view that they lose a lot of what they kill when they kill big animals so he'll try and steer clear of going after things like kudu and, and and giraffe and those kind of things because invariably he just loses it and the energy expense to bring them down is not does not equal you know the amount of sustenance he gets out of it so far better to go for things like an impala which he can hoist and feed off lazily over a few days than it is to go after something like a giraffe where he's gonna you know lose it very quickly so not surprised that he kind of didn't care too much for the kudu if there'd been a baby kudu i think it would have been a very different story a leopard does enjoy a baby kudu so I didn't get the name M if you can just repeat that for me. Freeborn. So Tingana is as far as we know, I mean we don't have an exact age. It's not like Hosana or Tandi or you know those animals that were born in this area that we know when they were born and can kind of narrow it down to a few weeks or even the, a few months. Um, Tingana was a male that came in and, and theoretically we, we think when he arrived that he was about four or five years old and given the timeline it would make him now around 12 roughly. So we think he's about 12 years old and given his facial features and his ears and those kind of things it very much does look around that age so 12 would be my guess roughly. Um, he could be a little bit younger, a little bit older, but it's around that age. And that's a good age for a male leopard. I mean, a lot of the male leopards here in the Sabi Sands will lose condition from this age and will then begin to start to kind of decrease their territories and will often then become fairly nomadic we'll take him fuller he's a prime example of a male leopard that actually became less dominant um, as he got older and most of the male leopards do do this we saw with campan tyson mafufanyan jordan all of these guys as they get to around 12 13 they start to then relinquish their territories a little bit for younger individuals that will start to come into these areas and, and take over they fitter they're healthier they're able to patrol more and so you see these kind of things happen and you end up with a with you know these guys then being pulled out so he's getting to the twilights of his career no doubt i mean no one's under any false pretenses and it will be a sad day when he's not the dominant male but hopefully he can be much like mvula in that he can somehow figure out a way between everybody so that there's no issues when it comes to you know figure out a way to kind of be nomadic around everyone he doesn't actually get himself into a bad situation where he has to fight with somebody and get badly injured that's what i'm hoping anyway it's obviously doesn't always happen that way and you know i sometimes wonder which is worse is it's worse when the male leopard at the end of his life gets attacked by another male and it's over quickly or is it worse when you see something like mvula who ended up just wasting away and kind of starving to death rather than actually being you know fighting his way and dying by the kind of sword he lived by in, in living and what challenging for a territory so i don't know it's, it's a mixed feeling it's always sad either way when a big old male leopard disappears from an area so hopefully that won't be anytime soon i'm hoping tingana can cling on for another year year and a half that would be ideal you know, it would certainly allow time for Hosanna to to stay in this area well, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe it's much like people, and that's the lazier they are, the you know, the less they feel like. Well, the less physical activity they do, the lazier they become. I'm not quite sure. It's an interesting observation. I don't think so. I think it's more age related. So the older they get, the often lazier they become. Although there were some individuals that were 
you know old that used to still walk a lot i remember you know watching tyson when he got a bit older he still moved quite a bit and still did quite a lot and went all over the show and so you know it's it's an interesting kind of take i i don't know that's you, you look at tandy she certainly is not showing her age at 12 she's still very mobile and moves all out all over the place tingana is much the same he's also very much like that he moves quite a bit and does quite a lot and really kind of missions around even at his age now and Mpula, well he was a big walker as well but slowed right down towards the twilight of his career so I remember the one day with Mvula, he was seen on the Sand River in the morning and by that afternoon was crossing into Manyaleti, which is a long, 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 long place. Um, he's he used to walk a long way and kind of, it was interesting just to see how he slowed right down towards the end. He used to make much shorter walks and it's more an age-related thing. You probably find his body gets sore, he gets, you know, joints get sore, muscle is wasting a little bit, so it makes it much harder for him to be able to actually do what he needs to do so it's a tough thing you know getting old is not easy <laughs> as I'm sure many of us can attest to it does make life a little bit more difficult and being physically active as you get older is not always that easy Whew. it's a hard life thing on you can see a big kind of deep breath as he's just sitting there hoping now the Sun is just starting to go down so pretty sure that we're getting to that time of the day where he's going to start waking up and he's just popped his head up because of a branch that one of the guys just drove over so it's probably why he's kind of done that there are some impalas there they go they're just going across the road now so you'll see some of our antennas but there goes an impala just disappearing over there so not too far that's the last of the impalas that i've seen uh, there might be one more but they've just crossed a little bit too far i think for tingana to actually have realized that they were there quite nice now everybody's left us again and it's peaceful and quiet right well Tingana's still sleeping which is pretty par for the course this afternoon and it sounds like James apparently is still also bumbling about and I'm hoping that he'll get some luck with Shadulu as the evening closes in yes I'm hoping desperately that I'm going to get some luck Unfortunately, I haven't had any at the moment. Oh, stop, press. There's a Cape turtle dove. It's gone. You see, no luck at all. Now, I must just tell you a funny story. As we were coming down this road last, uh, during our rehearsal for the TV shows, uh, this was on Friday morning, so two mornings ago, we came just around this corner, and I thought I saw a puff adder on the side of the road. And I said to... Craig, who was on camera, Craig, there's a puff adder on the side of the road. He said, no, no, it's a zebra carcass. And it was Tingana. <laughs> Which I thought was quite amusing. Anyway, Tingana resembles a carcass at the moment, of course, because of his refusal to get up and do anything other than sleep or steal food. Yes, I thought so too, him. I thought it was easily... Tingana can easily be confused with a puff adder and or a zebra carcass. This, we've had a number of interesting misidentifications. Craig spotted a genet in a tree once and said, there's Tlalamba, which was quite funny. <laughs> I think I called a scrub here a buffalo. I don't know how I managed to get that wrong. Anyway. At least we're seeing things, you know. Whether or not we're identifying them properly in the darkness is another matter. What we've done is we've come further east to see if we can't pick up something else. We gave up in the west where Shidulu was. Oh, look at this, David. It's the two amigos. Which one do you want, the backlit one? Is that all right? Let me get out of the way. Don't forget to click when you come back to me. Beautifully backlit Nyalabul. You can see little strings of citrus colours. Do you like that, David? Citrus colours infusing his white mantle. Hmm. And again, that Sunday peacefulness. Was that an intentional rack focus, David? Oh, very nice. 
was going to say, David, I didn't think that that was a particularly entertaining stick to be looking at, but, you know, it's up to you. You're the artist here. I'm just here to interpret what you shoot. You can hear no bird song at all. Just one Franklin calling in the far distance and you'll be able to hear the wind whistling through the tops of this torchwood tree above us. My goodness gracious me, we're going to go across to the nest camera now. It's having an afternoon of extreme action. Now, it seems like there's a few gremlins that are out and about, and so you're back with us and, well, a Tingana that's rolled over since you've last seen him. I'm thinking he might wake up at some point, and the reason why I say that is because there's a vehicle not too far away that's got a flat tyre, and so they're having to change their tyre, and I'm wondering if maybe, just maybe, the noise of the tyre being jacked and taken off and all those kind of things will be able to actually wake our sleepy duke up because the sun is setting. It's that time of the day where he should theoretically be starting to wake up, as you can see there. Beautiful, isn't it? Perfect winter sunset. You often get these very orange sunsets in winter, and that's all because of the amount of dust in the air, as well as often the fires that have been lit all over the place that allow a bit of smoke to go up and filters that sun and just makes it a little bit more kind of, in, what would the word be, diffused is probably the best word for it. So it's a nice kind of soft coloration that you get in the winter months, which is always very, very pleasant. Now, like I say, I hope that that's going to wake up the Duke because it's gotten to that time of the day where he should start moving. His tummy is very full. I wonder if he didn't steal some form of a carcass or kill something last night because he kind of came following Tundi's track so we know that she had a small steering book but I think there was not very much left by the time Tundi and Columba had fed off it so it can't really be them unless they killed something else or he managed to find himself his own meal and hoover it down as quick as possible. One thing I have noticed with Tingana over the past few weeks of following him around, which has been a delight, is that he can put away a serious amount of food in a single sitting. I watched him the other day with that impala carcass and also with the diker carcass, where he got up into a tree and he literally hoovered down the entire carcass. There was a diker that he had just close to the camp when we were doing, I think it was during one of our rehearsals, maybe last week, Friday, or week before Friday. Um, and he just ate the whole diker, which is pretty impressive. I mean, we've seen most of the dikers that Hosanna has killed has been at least a two-day affair, but he just ate it all. So it could have been something like that that he hoovered down. There's definitely a nice swell to that belly, which is always a good thing. And whether or not it's, he took it or killed it himself doesn't really matter. Either way, it's it's a good sign for the aging duke when you see him with a full belly. You never really want to see him going back to what we saw at the beginning of this year. It was quite sad, actually. And I was looking at some footage and some pictures that I had of him from January, February, March. And it really was, it, he was a shadow of what he is now. He was skinny, he looked emaciated, and he just looked tired and old and really not himself. And then as things have now kind of gone, he's made this miraculous comeback where he really does look back into good shape and he ha is showing a little bit more signs of age though that's for sure I also had some pictures that I was looking at from um, 2016 2015 and he definitely looked a lot kind of younger and fitter but I suppose you know two years is a long time in a leopard's life and definitely a few more nicks and cuts on the ears and a little bit more white around the face and you know well, that's kind of how it goes I suppose but also what's interesting with him is that his dewlap seems to have continued to grow it's still very big and I had to giggle because I was looking at the footage we had of him the other day when he had that impala in the knobthorn tree which he stole from Tandy and Columba which was I think last week Thursday or Wednesday last week and there was a point where he was cleaning his paws and I can't remember if we were live or not but he was cleaning his paws on this 
tree and he was kind of leaning down and forward at a 45 degree angle to the ground and because of it the skin on his neck and dewlap was falling forward and he almost looked like what is the name of those dogs that gets almost pug like in a way because all of his dewlap folded skin had kind of flapped down past his jaws and was all rolled up around his face it was very comical to see i must try and find a picture of it and i'll try and show all of you what i'm talking about but it was very very funny to see it's just kind of more and more skin is being added around that face and stretched out as he's gotten older he surely has to have one of the biggest dewlaps out of all the leopards that we see up here or actually in general in the Sabi Sands it's a really big big well-developed dewlap that he's got it makes his head and neck look really good so I suppose that's also quite intimidating to other leopards that are roam around here Pisces Bobby not really yeah, I mean he's it's a fairly cool day I am actually dreading the fact that I left my jersey at home because it means it's going to be a very cold afternoon for me um, but it's it's quite cool the wind is cold and so lying in the sun i think was actually quite nice for him i think he was absorbing a little bit of sunshine and staying fairly warm on a blustery cool afternoon and it, it's not a surprise that he's out in the open like this with a full belly he's not actively looking to hunt and being the relaxed duke he doesn't really have to go and lie in a thicket he's not kind of hiding from anybody or hiding from any prey animals he's just resting and sleeping and so he kind of probably found that he walked quite far today and found this little comfy spot of grass with a little bit of shade from this small tree and just decided well I'm gonna lie down right here and enjoy my nap for the afternoon and so that's probably what's happened he was left quite far from here actually this morning the guys said to me that they left him on the northern side of Buffles Hook Dam inside Buffles Hook so he came back onto the boundary and walked all the way westwards and then obviously during the day and then decided this is where he's going to rest so i'm not surprised that he is quite tired and taking it very easy but you know it's also it looks really out in the open because of where we parked we're in close proximity to him we you know only what 10 15 meters from where he is and you know he could easily be missed if you drove along the road right well from one sleepy cat that is kind of hidden in the grass i think brent leo smith is searching around for other sleepy cats that potentially are also hiding out in the long grass of the Massamara. Well, we've decided to abandon the sausages. They don't look like they're moving. Sorry, I know we don't normally wear sunglasses, but the dust coming off the road, I actually can't even see. So I'm just going to put my glasses on. You can see we're passing quite a lot of wildebeest and zebra as we go. It is quite a lovely afternoon here in the Mara, apart from the howling gale, of course. So we've decided we're going to start heading home. We, we left camp just before five this morning so 12 hours this is actually where we found the lions this morning they were right next to this little water hole lying over there <laughs> Tannis would like to know does dust act as a natural sunscreen I suppose yes it does Tannis but it also acts as a, a natural eye irritant and nostril irritant uh, which is quite irritating but yes, I suppose it would to a degree act as a bit of a natural sunscreen. Uh, after days like this out in the field, when you have a shower and you actually wash your hair, the water turns completely brown. Uh, that's how much dust is it. And also, because we're in the Mara and this is all volcanic soils, it is so fine, it gets in everywhere and your teeth um, in our breakfast boiled eggs this morning we had free Mara dust with that uh, with them we try to put salt on them but the salt blew away so yeah there's a lot of dust at the moment also it hasn't rained for a couple of days now we're gonna trying to head out oh here we go where 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 are those now and the worst thing is when you see one of these guys coming at you like a bloody rate of knots you got to get prepared for the dust storm that's coming. Where are my dust goggles? I couldn't find them earlier. Now, the reason I'm wearing my, uh, oh, look, fortunately the wind's actually, well, Vildi, take your life into your own hands. The wind's actually doing us a favor this time. Passing away. Oh no, there's another car coming. It's the traffic, traffic in the mire. 
Okay, well, hopefully I'll see you just now as I've got past all the dust. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's go to a man who I know probably hates dust more than I do, amongst many other things, James Henry. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't mind dust. It's the diesel I minded when I was there in the Mara. It is very difficult driving with the wind behind you because diesel and dust form a cloud around you and that's what you inhale the whole time. Anyway, we don't have any diesel or dust over here. We've just got the sunset going down there on this Sunday afternoon here. World Elephant Day. No elephants in the sun. Isn't that pretty? Well done, David. Excellent job, as usual. I do love how David Gitu spends a great deal of time congratulating his cameraman. I think it's a good idea. Otherwise they get a bit testy, these fellows, you know. <laughs> the sun's going down on another week, David. Sunday afternoon, coming to a close. Don't know why I'm talking like that. We'll stop immediately. Very pretty. You can see the wind's still blowing. Not as hard as it is in the Masi Mara, but it is blowing. And we're heading towards Twin Dams, hoping to find whatever we can at Twin Dams. Uh, pretty much goalless at this stage, because we haven't managed to find what we set out to, and that was Shidulu. Nor have I found any other leopard tracks. This is my face of shame. Why are you laughing at my face of shame, Dave? It's not funny at all. It's my face of shame. You may also notice that my jacket has got a number of um, strange lesions on it. I think it was ironed by mistake. It's a bit odd. Anyway, it doesn't actually look too bad on camera. It looks worse in real life. No, it's not ideal, thank you, Emma. I agree with you. I may have to purchase another one. Or sew my blanket into a jacket, that's probably a good idea. Let's pull up onto the damn wall here and see what we can find. Oh, hang on a second. I'll tell you what I would like to do is get a little bit of jackalberry fruit action. I think all the spoons have taken the jackalberry fruits. Let's see if we can find one. Here's one. No, just the husk. Would you like the word husk, David? It's quite nice to say husk. Try. They've all been absolutely devoured. No, here's one. Here are two, actually. Have you ever had one, David? I'm sure you have. Here we go. Don't worry that it's been in the mouth of a baboon. I wouldn't bite on that end, I'd bite on this end, okay? Peel it a bit and then just take the fruit. Hmm, that's very nice. It's quite um sticky. Normally much sweeter than this one is. Excuse me. It is horrible. <laughs> They're actually normally very nice. I'm not surprised the baboon rejected that one. <laughs> it was a very faint taste of sweetness followed closely by a 
It was like somebody had stuffed a dust-filled vacuum cleaner into my mouth and turned it on to blow. <laughs> right, well, thank goodness David bought 10 litres of water on drive with him. Hmm. Right, well, Brent has managed to find in amongst his cloud of diesel and dust the great king of the jungle, and I'm not referring to him, of course. <laughs> well, it's not the sausage tree pride. It's the Awinos in almost the exact same spot I had them yesterday, evening and morning. Here's the little boy. So they only ate a small gnu last night, so they are still looking quite hungry. Doesn't he have impressive whiskers on him? There are some wildebeest not too far away. And uh, the others are quite far off. Um, I've lost sight of them now. Oh, she's miles away. So there's that Balanites tree right next to the main road. There, there we go. There's one there. We come to the left a little bit, there should be another. Or is it to the right? Anyway, there are other... Oh, where has she gone? Oh, there she is, so it's quite far left of the other one. There we go, back right, slightly. There we go, there she is. But this girl looks like she's going to walk right next to us. Hello, a we know? Or is it... Oh no, where'd the girl go? Is this the little boy or the young female? Young female, I think. Hello, little girl. Okay. Let's just go back a little bit. She's, I just need to see where she's going. Now there is a missing lioness and I've noticed the lions in the Mara will often use these big drains while their hunt keeps them below the eye line, same as they would use a, a little riverbed or a stream. Now this is the young lioness, so not one of the adults, so not one of the more experienced ones, so it's going to be interesting to see what she gets up to. see there's some wildebeest over there there's one there there's one even closer to the road now, quite often as I said they'll lie in the road using it as cover oh but now there's a silly gnu this is what often happens at this time of the year when there's so much food around those ones have spotted the lines behind us. You can see they are on high alert, which could work to our young girl's advantage. So there's that young boy behind her. Oh no, there's a lioness coming across the open behind us. And they've seen her. Now that could really work to her advantage because a lot of the focus is now going to be on um, the, the others that are actually behind. N none of them have noticed her just yet. Now, Mrs. Anno is wondering, who are the male coalitions that lead the Owino pride? That is a very good question. We've seen them with the Triangle Boys before, or the Kitra Tembo males, as they're called. But what I've noticed in the Mara is that anything goes. I've seen the Sausage Tree pride mate with, obviously, Kipuli, the two young boys, and then they were also mating with some completely unknown male that came through from the south. A bit of a skittish, aggressive male. Oh, you're in the wrong spot, girl. You wanted to be right under his schnoz as he tried to cross the road. 
Mas ainda não se pode dizer. No, yeah, I don't think he has. But she seems more focused on different wildebeest. Nariko is wondering, are they taking positions to get ready to hunt? Well, she is. Uh, you must remember, she's she's not too much over a, a year, year and a half, maybe a little bit older. So she's not the most experienced. The big girls are, are miles away, five, six hundred meters behind us. The ones that do most of the hunting, she might have just got bored. Now there is a lion of wildebeest coming because they spotted the lions behind us off to the left that might walk straight into the area where she is. There they go. No, where, there, let's go. No, yes, no. Strange creatures, wildly beasts. I think her inexperience is going to count up, uh, count against her this evening. So I'll have a quick look behind me, see if there's any more lions appearing here. Not yet. I think I've accidentally pulled my comms out. Sorry about that. Let's just keep an eye on these wildies. Well, look, she's watching them carefully. Vim, did you get those comms? Yep. Hi, Joy. Joy, one of the biggest misconceptions created by The Lion King is that wonderful movie as it was, it was created so many bad ideas about wild animals. Uh, no, male lions do not lead the pride, and uh, neither do females. Uh, the prides are quite democratic. No one's really the boss, they're just a sort of a, a unit. However, with males, males will have multiple prides of females, if they are able, that they will mate with. The more females they can have, the more they can spread their genetic code, which is what they're progr programmed to do. Now, while we're on the fallacies of the Lion King, oh, oh something's going on. I can't see why she's running. Where are you going? Did your mom call you back? Were you being a naughty little girl? Okay. <laughs> Don't know what's happened. I think uh, one of the adults might have started calling. We can't really hear anything in this. Whoopsie, sorry, that's a big bump. I was watching the line in this wind. Oh, she's gonna pop out. Is she, I think she's gone. To, yeah, I, as, I th as I suspected, she wasn't seriously hunting. Um, more bored and playing. And it looks like she's gone to play with the other lions now. Now, it's not uncommon to see them doing this during the migration. They they sort of know if they really want you, they don't have to go far, and they'll catch something. There'll be one slightly ailing wildebeest somewhere. So she just went to go pounce upon some of the other lions. There we go. Three out of five are weenos. And uh, so guys, we're 100% live. I just want to show you a car in front of us quickly. Now that is the Michigan State University hyena researchers. They are the best at getting stuck in the Mara. They also get stuck everywhere and on anything at all times. So hi guys, we've had to rescue them a few times. And if they're not stuck, their battery won't work on their car. So we, we find them across the Mara all over the place. <laughs> so of course we, they've been a massive help to us uh, with the identifications of the North Clan and the Happy Zebra Clan. And uh, they are definitely good fun. Even when they do get stuck, they are in good spirits. Jamie even rescued them one night after they had to spend the whole night in the car. But as I think these Awinos are not going to hunt just yet, I'm going to keep heading northwards towards home. It's been quite a long day, and it looks like it's been a long day for the Awino pride as well. Oh, 
Well, from these lazy cats to another lazy cat all the way back in South Africa, Tingana. Indeed, uh, he has been the laziest of lazy cats this afternoon. I really would have thought by now he would have woken up at least just put his head up to look around, but he has not done anything. We even had Franklin's bursting out of the bushes and squealing and making noise, and he didn't even flinch. So he's obviously decided he's going to sleep long into the evening and probably find that Tingana is going to decide to wake up one minute before we probably finish this evening. That's a normal trick for Tingana. That's why we often find him so late in the drive is because had he been in a thicket where we couldn't see him, you find that he only starts to walk and actually wake up just as our drives start to finish a lot of the time. So not ideal, but we will be patient. I mean, we've got a little bit of time still and hopefully he will wake up in the next little bit. There's definitely hasn't, not one vehicle has caused him to stir or anything like that. He's still very much asleep at this stage. Yes, Mr. Tingana, time for you to wake up, boy. I think we've been patient this afternoon. I, definitely has been an exercise in waiting for an animal to wake up and you know often lions get a bad rep for sleeping a long period of time but leopards sometimes are the same and sometimes can sleep for quite long periods as well nancy you say you go tingana you do your thing well yes exactly i i mean he's he's a dominant male leopard and so rest is in order in order to be able to kind of keep up with the times and make sure that he's fit and healthy and is able to patrol and get to all the places he needs to go and so having a good nap is nothing wrong with that it's just it would be nice if we could just get his head up for a few minutes just so that we could see his beautiful eyes he's got such a nice pair of eyes does tingana it's kind of aqua, aquamarine color in, at times and so always enjoy kind of when he's looking he's, although he does have a bit of a dopey face when he's sleepy like this it's quite funny when he's had a lot to eat and he's a bit sleepy he does have one of the dopiest faces out of any of our leopards not like his son who's always got wide-eyed and bushy tail in the form of Hosanna who's running around all over the place and I wonder where he is it's been kind of two days since we've seen Hosanna which is not normal for us i mean we normally get lucky and we were able to find him somewhere so hopefully he's going to be around i wonder i think he's got to kill somewhere is what i think is that when we last saw him he managed to find himself a meal which was yesterday morning and that's where he's sitting that's at least what i firmly believe but he's such an active hunting cat that it would be sort of quite difficult to think that he hasn't appeared somewhere if he wasn't sitting on a carcass you know he walks around too much and is too busy that when he is looking for food that we would have picked up a sign of him in some place so also the rain has made it really difficult i know it sounds odd because we didn't have much rain i mean we only ended up i think having about three millimeters of rain over two days but it was just enough to cake the, or just to wet the surface of the soil and really cake it together and make it hard and i promise you seeing leopard tracks at the moment is really not easy at all the the road surfaces are still need to be broken up again with cars and and make them soft and even the the areas off the road the animals need to walk through again and just dust it all up in a bit of cold windy or dry windy condition should i say also needs to kind of come in and just to get everything that nice soft powder again so that we can see very easily and once that happens then i think we'll pick up Hosanna pretty quickly but I'm sure he's going to make an appearance at the dam cam again in the next few days I mean it's oh so there's just a... that's just an update I was just trying to hear it sounds like there's two wild dogs and some and a leopard with a kill somewhere but I can't hear where Sounds like maybe in the east somewhere, or maybe in Koro or somewhere like that. It's difficult to pick up with so much wind. The guy is speaking, but it's just his radio is muffled. I'm sure James maybe got a better update than I did. But it sounds like somewhere something amazing is happening. There's lots going on all around us, I suppose, and it's, you know, we can't have all the action on our side all the time. And we've been so fortunate over the last few weeks because we've had non-stop. I mean, we really haven't had it very difficult, have we? We've been fortunate in having a lot of content and a lot of things happening on Numa pretty regularly over the past few weeks. And like I say, Hassan has kind of been the star of that show, but there's also been dogs. We've had the Nkuhuma Pride back. Tingana's been around. Tani Lamba, Shadulu even making an appearance today. And I must be honest, I was a bit jealous this morning because 
Last night I got a, f- a phone call from a friend saying that Shadulu was mobile east towards our boundary. So when I came down this morning to do the nest cam, I told James, it might be worth just driving Vertel Axis and Shadulu might be there. And he drove up and then found Shadulu, you know, walking down the road. And I haven't seen her since I've been back from the Mara. So the last time I saw Shadulu was in in March, end of March. So I'm quite looking forward to seeing her again. It's been a very long time. I quite enjoy spending time with her. She's such a busy cat that it's always a pleasure to follow her around, often posing in great places and kind of making herself available for many, many different photographic opportunities as well as just she always kind of is up to something. So I enjoy it. I know this morning she didn't move that much, but she was hunting her bunny. And so, you know, she was she was a focused cat this morning, which is unusual for her because generally she's all over the place and moving around. So I would like to see her again. It's been so long that it's always good to catch up with her. Uh, who else haven't we seen? Tumbo would be nice to have for him to come back. No updates on him, though, unfortunately. Still nothing since a few weeks ago so it would be nice if we could get something on our little boy as well and hopefully he makes an appearance again at some point it's getting more and more unlikely that he will but you never know one can always hope um who else haven't we seen much of kuchava mr well mr q as well quarantine would be nice for him to pop out at some point and even hukamuri has been rather absent of late so i've got a lot of leopards to catch up with since i've went away hopefully they'll all start to make an appearance but we can't complain like i say we've had such a good time recently with leopard there's been pretty much daily that we've had them so gremlin general i i want to know are you one that is going to be removing gremlins from now on from our systems because if that's the case then you are most welcome to do so the gremlins are a pain in our backside so hopefully you will be able to command them and get rid of them but tingana does sleep a lot yes because he's getting older but also because of his condition that he's in right now so he's full he's healthy and there's no reason for him to be out hunting at the moment this morning he was patrolling he soared this morning so he announced his territory so he's not really got a reason at, and there's not many males that are pushing him at the moment you know since he's been up and moving and talking and making a lot of noise Hukumuri's not put up much of a fight he's decided no ways am i dealing with this angry leopard that is walking around making so much noise and so you know he's kind of asserted himself back again so i suppose he can be fairly happy in the fact that he's got a female who's currently got a cub he's got you know access to food and water he's he's in a healthy condition his belly is full and so no need to march um, too much and no need to really move around that much so he can have a nice little nap and have a bit of a sleep but i do think he'll wake up I, I mean i think it might take him in the next 15 20 minutes but i think now is the time where he's going to start stirring you can already see he's moving a little bit right now it sounds like james has found something so we're going to quickly send you across to him oh my goodness well at least you've got a brief flash there how dare they walk off the road there those are shelley's franklins everybody and I know that we mention the Shelley's Franklin and the fact that it goes But we seldom show you the Shelley's Franklin. We just did there. They were sitting perfectly placed on the road and then decided to go away. <sighs> Let's continue. We were having one last sort of scratch about where we saw Shidulu. And you did get them at the beginning, well that's good. Hello? Shelley's Franklins? Yes, there they are. Yeah, well, I didn't know you had to do that. All you have to do is shout Shelley's Franklin and they arrive. I think there's one on the left of us as well, David. Yeah, look, it's been left behind, separated from its family, from the rest of its covey. Hmm. There we go. Don't worry, we'll be out of here very shortly. You got it there, Dave. Middle of screen. There you are, up a bit. It's that bird. There we go. Thing with the beak. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I tell you, I think that the Franklins have some of the most beautiful feathering plumage. 
It is not quite as bright as that of the Hyacinth Macaw, for example, but it's got such a subtle beauty to it, shiny, detailed colours, bronzes and golds and oranges. There it is, it's in front of us now, David. Again, it's the feathered thing walking through the grass there with the beak. There we are, it's going to come across the road, you shouldn't miss it there. Come on now, onto the road, here we go. Aren't they pretty? I think they're gorgeous. Yes, your friends went in there. They're waiting for you. Very delicious meal waiting for you, I'm sure. Roasted seeds, perhaps. Oh, and one of them's flown away. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to find now. Alrighty, on the go. David is, of course, scanning with the flea to try and find the Shadulu's heat signature. See, Nick, the fastest little critter that we have here. Well, ah. I mean, other than the cheetah, you mean? I suppose if we're talking about things other than mammals, it would be the solifuge. The solifuge is an arachnid that looks terrifying and is totally harmless, but they have an amazing ability to run at great speed. So I'm going to go with the solifuge, or red Roman spider they're sometimes called. They're not spiders at all, and they hunt with these vicious... Um, I've forgotten the proper name for them now. Basically, mandibles, nasty toothed mam mandibles. They saw at their prey with. Really not a nice way to go, but they're very quick. Yes, I don't think there are the pedipalps, Louise. I think they are aren't the pedipalps on either side of those two nasty teeth. Anyway, I'll have a look. Might be. Might be pedipalps. I'm going to have to turn some lights on now. There we are. I'm not nocturnal. I cannot see in the dark. David, can you see in the dark? Clearly not. As evidenced by your ability to see that feathered thing that was running past us. Anyway, I don't blame you. I can't see in the dark either. You might even have to retrieve a spotlight. Oh. Ah, the chelicerae, that's what we're going for. Thank you, Louise. The chelicerae, it's got some vicious barbed chelicerae, and they, they rub together like this and saw their prey in half, and then in quarters, and then eighths, and sixteenths, thirty-twos, sixty-fourths, hundred and twenty-eighths. Two hundred and fifty-sixths. Five hundred and twelves. One thousand and twenty-fourths. Two thousand and forty-eighths. I'm sure I've gone wrong somewhere along the line. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Emma. Emma says we should do that for the kids' show. I think it's a very good idea. If the solifuge were to cut this termite in half, and then in half again, what would we have? A quarter of a termite, sir? Correct, John. And, Billy, if we were to cut the termite again in half, what would we have? A sixteenth of a termite, sir? Well done, Billy. Now, Amy, if we were to cut the termite in half again, what would we have? Oh, that's easy, sir. One thirty-second. Very good. Amy. And you, Wayne, if we were to cut it in half again, what would we have? Not a lot of termites, sir. Very correct. Wayne is not a maths boffin, clearly. <laughs> These are the things we must talk about when looking in the night for creatures that might be active. David, have you found us anything with your thermal camera? Oh, you have to keep it on me, yes. We're alive. I think we're still alive. Are we still alive? Poor old Wayne. 
Poor old Wayne. I think there's a Wayne in every classroom. <laughs> yes, and Emma says, you better be careful not to insult our viewers called Wayne. Yes, I don't mean to insult you. Yes, indeed. Oh, hooray! I think this is wonderful news. I believe that the son of the Duke, Osana, has arrived at the dam camp. We're going to make our way there at some speed, and while we motor there, well, you're going to stay with us, I suppose. Here we go. Vroom, vroom! Good. Much better idea. Let's go across to Tristan. Well, good luck, James. May speed be with you and safe driving. And Wendy do, does not give you any hassles on your way to the dam cam. And we, we called it at some point that he'll get to the dam cam. And I'm pretty sure he has a kill somewhere. I had tracks for him in the Mulwati yesterday. I wonder if there's not a little diker sitting in a tree somewhere along that Mulwati system. And he's now just coming for an evening drink before heading back towards his kill. I think that might be the case, actually. But either way, very exciting. And always good to hear that the little prince is still, well, in the area that he should be, right in the center of Juma. It makes all of us very happy. Tingana is not at all phased by this news. As you can see, he's not that excited. Tingana, you, will, you must be excited. The little prince is back. Nope, still nothing. I asked him, but he didn't really want to lift his head. You'll find probably Tingana there at some point. If there's food, Tingana will sniff it out, that's for sure. That nose will be down to the ground and trying to find it. I hope that it doesn't happen because Hosanna deserves a whole meal from start to finish for himself, particularly a biggish one because, well, he's had pretty much all of them robbed by various family members over the past few weeks and so I'm hoping that he gets to sneakily have it all to himself so we won't speak too loud about food around Tingana because that might wake him up and he'll go strutting off to go and steal it and to take it for himself which I know we joke around about it I really shouldn't actually joke please don't hate Tingana anybody because he's just doing what any leopard would do there's nothing wrong with the fact that he takes these kills and like I say indirectly it is perfectly fine because as long as he takes a kill and is tolerant of Hosanna means that Hosanna gets to stay and doesn't have to fight with any other ma male leopards in order to find a territory and therefore is in a lot safer than if he was walking around in areas like Gondolozi and places like that. So as much as it is always tough for little Hosanna who looks up and gazes upon his dad eating his meal, it's the best thing because it means he doesn't have to worry about kind of well, losing out to other big males and having to actually fight with anybody to get safety. Now... I wonder if Hosan, I mean Tingana will actually even wake up this evening. I thought by now we would at least have a head up or an ear flicking or some sort of twitch. But, well, as you can see, zero is happening. In fact, he's, I don't think he's even moved an ear in the last 20 minutes. We went for a little tinkle and earlier to try and kind of see if we could just relieve the bladders and he didn't wake up for that either when we went off across the road anyway let's send you across to steve who i believe is on the nest cam and i wonder if the little prince is going to make an appearance on the nest cam him i think i am on the right one emma can tell me if i am not um the dam cam has spotted him and he is mobile towards the dam hello everybody we are looking for hosana i haven't quite seen him yet but we are on the nest cam once again and hoping to f spot him moving towards and the dam cam has spotted him not sure where he is folks but we can only stand by here and watch with the now the installation of this side of the dam and the watering hole we are able to see things coming up on the side and right in front of us where those rocks are is where Osana killed the daker only weeks ago and uh, this is a very good spot. So hopefully, I can't see what's going on in the dam cam, but hopefully he is making his way up here at the moment, which could be quite exciting to, to reveal him on the nest cam this afternoon. Okay, well, while we change our angle, James is on his way in to come and have a look at Osana, and uh, we'll come right back here. Is 
Yes, I know, but I didn't even know that she was with him. We're live. Oh, hello. <laughs> We're live. We're just heading down as fast as we can towards what is that on the road? Is that a diker? No, it's a, yes, it is. Spaker the diker. It's just gone into the bush there. We are driving as fast as we can, but in the safe and responsible manner, of course, to the dam to see if we can't find Hosanna. Is he still on the dam cam? Emma? Is he still on the dam cam? Oh, he's still there. Fantastic. We are nearly there. When you say he's walking away, Emma, do you mean that he's going east, west, north or south? Towards Mvumbu. Good. Towards Mvumbu we'll go. We're on our way towards Mvumbu. Are you enjoying your ride, everybody? I hope that you are not sitting with a drink in your lap because it'll be all over your clothes by now. Here we go, about to drop into second gear. Four-wheel drift around this corner. Are you holding on, David? Here we go. Woo! Oh, no, we'll have to slow down. There's an impala. That's because we're being responsible, you see. And the wildebeest. There we go. Oh, they've already got him there. Texans got him. Just found him. Sorry, let me just try and get hold of him. Tax, I didn't hear you calling, sorry. Where's he gone? He's gone north. He's gone quite a long way away. Okay, never mind. We should get lucky. He's crossed over. There's no way you're gonna get him on the nest camera now. He isn't close to the jackalberry, going more to the north. Right, well, let's keep going. It can only take a year to get over the damn wall here. All right, let's go back to Tristan while we try and figure out what's going on over here. Well, Good luck, James. Hopefully you'll figure it out. We've just left Tingana now. He's still very, very sleepy. And, well, we thought we would just try and see if there's anything else about before we head off down back towards camp. And I was wondering if maybe, just maybe, Tandi or Tlalamba was around. I was thinking that we'll have a little sort of look and see if there's anything happening but it doesn't seem like anything there's always Gari cut line is a great road to drive for Tandy and Kalamba they often just pop out here in the most random times so it's always worth just having a little look and like I said with Tingana being as sleepy as he is we gave it a good shot but he still hadn't even twitched by the time we left and so I thought no we'll just carry on and see if we can't whip out something else maybe we get lucky and we'll find something like a Imagine a pangolin. A pangolin would be good. I haven't seen a pangolin in a long time. Come on, pangolin, come out. That would be nice. I saw somebody saw an aardvark in the last few days. I think it was in the western sector. And there's also been a few pangolins that have been seen to our west and our south. It would be quite nice for either of those species to come out. We always say this every night drive as though it's going to happen and that we're going to find it. And we never really do. But I'm hoping that by some miracle a one will pop out at some point and we can actually show you guys properly. I know we have seen a pangolin before on our drives, which is always exciting, but it was not easy to get a proper view of it. So I would really like one to be on a road or something like that for all of you because they're just the most fascinating creatures and obviously highly, highly endangered and being trafficked at a rate of knots. So it would be really good to actually find them. Oh, hello. 
Do you want to jump on board? We know somebody would like to meet you or it's going to run away. But there was a diker that was standing there and that would be a perfect meal for Hassan. And I'm sure James would love to have that diker with him now because, well, it sounds like he's still looking for Hassan. I am doing my best, everybody, for the last minute while we try and find our old princey. Let's see, it always seems to me that when I want to turn left at the next junction, the junction is always 100 miles from where I want to be. Right, here we go. He was apparently heading down here towards this area. Taxon couldn't follow him. We have 60 seconds left, I'm afraid, to find him. We have had a leopard today, so that's all right. We might be lucky around here. David, any luck with your fear? All right, I'm going to stop here and hope that he pops out, perhaps, on this game path over here. Can hear some birds alarming. Anyway, everybody, if we don't see him now, hopefully we'll see him tomorrow. We will be live, of course, at 6.30 Central African time until 8.30 tomorrow Central African time. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your questions and comments, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Until tomorrow morning, goodbye.